So hi, my dear friends, how are you doing? So uh, many of you have been asking us, sir, kindly do the RTP session and upload it on YouTube. So here we are, dear friends, paper six. For the first time ever, Institute has released an RTP. And uh, surprisingly, if you see the questions here are slightly different from the case studies that they have given here. So let us uh, do, uh, so welcome Tarun sir, welcome uh, Jinmaya sir also. All of us will be uh, handling this session. Uh, so, sir, so initially this case study is about the steel industry, as you, have, you can see there. And they are just uh, trying to tell you what all subjects they are testing. So, they are testing financial reporting, direct tax, uh, of course, corporate and economic law, indirect tax, advanced auditing, uh, everything. Except SCMP, this question has everything. And in fact, case study one has uh, SCMP also. We will do case study one later. So, now we are uh, uploading case study two, my dear friends. And of course, topics also they have given just for you to have a uh, knowledge as to what all is there. So 92C of the income tax side is transfer pricing, then 188 of the company law that is related party transaction along with company board and board uh, meetings of the board. And most importantly, guys, uh, very surprisingly, they have also given a question on FCRA, that is Foreign Contribution Regulation Act. So those of us who are thinking that only company law portion will come, think again, they are giving questions on FEMA, SEVI, FCRA, and anything under the sun. So, and even PMLA in one of the areas, PMLA area also was touched upon. So you can never say that, you know, nothing of these, only it is, you know, rooted only to few or few topics, nothing like that. Anything under the sun can come. So with that, let's directly go ahead uh, to para number one. I'll be reading it. And there are, I think, if I'm not wrong, five paragraphs. And based on these five paragraphs, there are questions. So let us read now. Uh, Yantra five medicine... paragraphs are there. And uh, paragraph one, uh, I will read, sir. I'll yes, read. sir. Sure. Go ahead, sir. Go ahead, sir. It's smaller. Go ahead, go ahead, sir. Go ahead. Yantra Pedasu Limited is an unlisted public company incorporated since 2005. So it's a public limited company, but it's unlisted. Engaged in the steel business with nine directors on its board. Okay. There is a company in Singapore named SYD PTE Limited in which it acquired 54% stake during the financial year 22 23. So this YPL has acquired a, a SP, SPL, yeah. SPL yeah. and thereby it became its first subsidiary company. Yeah. Mr. Sunil Verma has been appointed for the second consecutive term of five years as a managing director of YPL. Yes, sir. So here uh, I want to discuss a few things and then uh, because there are four concepts here all put together. The two concepts quickly we will uh, discuss. First is, uh, guys, this is an unlisted public company. So unlisted public company, uh, public company, or as you know, is a company in which the public holds shares. A private company is a company in which it has only two people, minimum two people as the uh, shareholders and can go up to maximum 200. Whereas public company is anything other than a private company. Unlisted means what? It is a company which is which has not listed its shares in the stock exchange. So basically your institutional investors would have held shares here. That is one. Second part is number of directors on the board. So uh, for a public company, there should be minimum three directors, but here there are nine directors, it's fine. Minimum should be three. So here it is nine directors, no problem. Uh, next, it has acquired 54% stake. So if you see the holding and subsidiary company definition, if you control more than half of the uh, total voting power of the other company or control the composition of the board of directors, then it is called holding subsidiary relationship. As you can see, it has acquired 54% stake. So here we can assume stake means total voting power. And total voting power means it is our equity share capital. They have held it. Then it has become its first subsidiary company. That's fine. Now, one more interesting point they are given. Mr. Sunil Verma has been appointed for the second consecutive term of five years as the man managing director of YPL. So this we have to see the uh, managing director provisions of company law, section 196, that is. So as per 196, you can be appointed as a managing director for up to five years at a time, up to five years at a time. So you can be appointed for one year, two year, three years, up to five years at a time. After that, you have to be reappointed for one more term. So here they are reappointing him for a second consecutive term. So you can keep on reappointing him for any number of terms that you want, no problem. But you need to follow the provisions of 196, 197, Schedule 5 and all those things. So that is what they are giving. Actually, this particular information in the context of this question is irrelevant. But they can add many more questions to this. So you need to understand one thing. Those of you who are watching us for the first time, we are not going to discuss only what is given in the uh, question and answers here. We'll also be discussing what are the other areas that they can ask in the exam. So 
the context of this uh, managing director, this person being managing director in the holding company is relevant only for the next sentence, which uh, Tarun sir is going to read. Apart yes. from that, it is not relevant for any other thing, but they can also ask other questions with respect to appointment of MD, etc., which in this question is not there. Yes, sir, Tarun sir. Yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, uh, let me also, uh, yeah, you want to add something or you can add, uh, you're reading. I want to add uh, one. You can add, sir, you can add, yes. Yeah. Yes, so that is this uh, YPL and SPL. These two uh, companies, for the purpose of GST, they are treated as related parties. So because uh, the same control is there even in GST, so even in customs also. So both as per GST law as well as customs act, these two parties are treated as related parties and the transactions between them, transaction value is not applicable. So both okay. under GST as well as under customs. And we need to determine the value in terms of rules. So whatever is the actual consideration that is uh, involved in this is irrelevant. So we have some rules like in GST, we have uh, rule 28, which talks about open market value, etc. And in customs also, we have identical goods, similar goods valuation. So that, that will be relevant. And uh, yes, sir, uh, I think in FR also, yeah, treated as related. Yeah, for also quite a few is there. Uh, when you said you read the first paragraph, no one thing strike my mind. Uh, not related to this directly. Now they give you the open book exam, right? Where you can take the books. Of course, we are confused which books to take. Maybe in the future they will allow one person, I think, who can mm -hmm. take an expert for you, and you can ask his guidance, or we can ask him to read. Maybe you can ask him to ask questions. I am mean, just if you foresee myself in this paper, what could be the possibility? They okay. can probably allow you uh, a mobile to sort of check and check on, check with AI, maybe never know. Yeah, maybe something like that. Maybe search and then based on that, you may yeah. uh, present and, the answer. Uh, yeah, and also in direct taxes, this would be called as associated enterprise for uh, transfer pricing norms. Since here you are seeing an uh, Indian company and a uh, foreign associated entity. Oh, so, they're, they're called as associated enterprise. Enterprise, yeah, yeah, associated enterprise. Associate means different. Uh, correct. Even in uh, company law, associate means different. It is okay. where obviously you have more than 20% uh, voting power. Yeah. So the, uh, what is the, in FR also, I think it's a similar line. So it's yeah, in, the, in FR, they don't use the particular definition. They just use the word control. Okay. And they would the word a significant influence, which we yeah. interpret it as a 50% for exam purpose at least. Okay. In reality, that may not And for, for associate, what is the percentage in my sir? Is yeah, that same same thing. They don't 20%. use the word percentage, they use the word significant influence. Okay. Uh, and again, based on our interpretations, past history, we usually say from exam, we say take 20% because of company law definition. Company but for law. FR, in this definition as such, they don't have any Not, particular okay. thing. So here it's called AE, that is Associated Enterprise. So enterprise, this is yes. Associated Enterprise. So basically we have company law holding subsidy relationship. We have uh, customs and, uh, you know, GST as sir mentioned, there is an, there's a related party. Here also in company law under 2 clause 76 also it's a related party. Apart from that, uh, for direct taxes purposes also it is a related party. Then for FR purpose also related party. Yeah. So for they FR can purpose, ask questions on anything. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Sorry. For FR purpose, I'll just add one more point because the word one used, even sir used, you also used, that is control. That is the single most word important after accrual in FR okay. whole subject itself. So, okay. for example, you say, right, uh, if you talk about holding subsidiary, there has to be a control. If you talk about the index 115, where revenue from uh, contract with customer, when you recognize revenue, when the control is transferred. So, if you go to definition of what is an asset, they say asset is a resource controlled by enterprise. They don't say owned by enterprise. So the word control is uniform across all Indias. So that is even in case it's holding subsidiary also the word control comes. But you know, why... in GST control is not defined. Oh, okay. okay. Control is not defined, but they're telling one person directly or indirectly controlling the another is related. Okay. Now so the control is ambiguous. In yeah. GST, there is no definition both in GST as well as in customs. Okay. So that's we depend on Companies Act. Correct. So Companies Act, and we say like uh, there are multiple cases, even in uh, old indirect taxes, excise, service tax also, where they say relying upon Companies Act, uh, if investment more than fifty percent or majority board of directors. Right. So, but as per India's, when you see control, na. So like, because now even that is also there, there was one material background material on GST released by ICI, 
We are taking for control as per India. Some two page information is given. No, so no, I did not small, understand. Like, no, they, they have series of case studies. Like, forget yeah. about India. I'll ask you one basic question. Yeah. I know you'll not answer. You cannot answer. Yeah. In family, who is the controller, sir? Husband or wife? Wife, wife. <laughs> so, you no, know, it's actually the husband. Many of our wives, who all decides. of our wives. Each no, of our wives seeing this. Will, no, like, it like. is the husband who decides, but he has the permission of wife to say that. Correct. So, uh, right. <laughs> so the, the, the definition of control is always you see and I see over there. But yeah, uh, the definition of control is very, very uh, ambiguous. Today we are not Except going home. Yeah. 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 Right. Everywhere else it is uh, <laughs> because series of things are there. Like So we have separate discussion. Like in FR, I almost spend like three, four hours just on that one word on control. Control. Then okay. We take to the different level. Even in company law, they have defined uh, control. They say that includes the what do you say? It, it it's an inclusive definition. Also includes controlling of the board of directors and stuff like that. It can yeah, also be through... who controls should be shown. That is the yeah. Reason. So there it includes even not just any shareholding what do you say pattern, but also a shareholders agreement also as well or management agreement also. So everything is included in the word control and that predominantly goes through G, uh, GST customs also. The same definition is used as sir also mentioned. Yes. I was not aware, sir. I thought, I mean, GST had a definition of the word control. I was not aware of this. They take it from company talk. Okay. GST, okay. GST is new law. Customs hmm. Act is not there. Customs also, okay. okay. Interesting. Customs Act. Immediately Correct. after Income Tax Act. But even in that, they have not given. Correct, sir. I just have one question for to Panura, sir. Since uh, it is unlisted public company, and they have acquired a foreign subsidiary. Yeah. Uh, should they do consolidation as per company law because it is unlisted public company? Uh, yeah. I know yeah, listed yeah. companies have to do, but for unlisted companies. That's what. So in uh, consolidation, one was actually your, uh, what do you say, uh, whatever as per SEBI regulations you have to do. But 129 is clear that you need to do even for that. That was a major concern that uh, should I do it for joint ventures also? I have to ask you that question also. Because in uh, company law, they had told you have to do for associates and joint venture and so all type of companies have to do. So right. I think there was some problem with Indias that did not include uh, associate, right? Sorry, JV, JV. Am I right? Uh, no, they have included. Maybe they have included even when there is no consolidation. Uh, I think uh -huh. that would be the situation. Correct. Right. Uh, which basically means earlier they said you have to include associate or joint venture only if you have a subsidiary. Because right. this will come only in consultant statements. But India said whether you have joint venture or associate or joint venture, you have to do a consolidation to include the respective. Uh, right. related so partners. 129 is clear in that regard. Yeah. So, so, so consolidation is applicable. So yes. Under uh, all the things you have to do. Okay. So, sir, next I'll read only three lines. Other than you related to us only. He has a daughter named Mrs. Sunita. It is Mr. Sunil Verma, who is the MD of the holding company, has a daughter named Mrs. Sunita, who's residing in Singapore since last six years. And she was appointed as director in SPL. Okay, so father is the MD of the holding company, whereas daughter is proposed to be appointed as the, uh, what do you say, director of the subsidiary company during the financial year 23-24 at a monthly remuneration of Singapore dollar 60,000 equals to, equivalent to 3 lakh rupees. This is a monthly remuneration. So here this is interesting because um, as per 2 clause 76 of Companies Act, uh, any director or the director's relative happens to be the related party. And here holding subsidiary company also is a related party anyway. And I am appointing a related party as a director in the subsidiary company. So they have an interesting thing under 188, section 188, subsection 1 clause F that is called holding of office or place of profit. So it is interesting to know that the daughter here need not hold any office, though they have used the word office, need not hold any office or place of profit because the company law has defined place of profit or office as purely whatever she's earning. So in this, they have told that she's becoming a director. Even if she's becoming an attender, I'm saying it doesn't matter as long as she's earning 3 lakh rupees. So here the crux of the issue is the money. So the company law says that under 188, if any of your relatives is earning something, and what is that something? Any remuneration is what 188 says, any remuneration. And then you will have to take the permission of the shareholders for this. And there is, there is a threshold though, there is a threshold, and threshold is 2.5 lakh rupees. So let me just write down here, 
the threshold is 2.5 lakh rupees monthly remuneration monthly remuneration monthly remuneration 2.5 lakh rupees under section 188 so if your related party is having any office or place of profit i again repeat office or place of profit has got nothing to do with office or a place designation does not matter it's about the money so if you are earning more than 2.5 lakh rupees per month monthly remuneration mind you then uh, that the company in this case not the subsidiary company mind you holding company holding company has to take permission of its shareholders for appointing the managing director's daughter as a director in the subsidiary company so that is one is the same for a foreign company also even if the subsidiary is a foreign subsidiary yes sir yes sir that applies to all types of companies uh, as long as it's a subsidiary indian yeah. subsidiary foreign subsidiary whatever holding uh, to add that remuneration what is remuneration say is it like gross in hand yeah. any so remuneration period? they have defined as you know everything that you can take except of course the year end bonus year end uh, per, uh, other things all year end payments are not taken like your uh, what do you say your performance linked incentives and perform performance linked bonus is not taken into consideration apart from that any remuneration uh, again remuneration is defined in 2 clause 78 anything that you can think of so all emoluments including uh, taxable perquisites non taxable perquisites uh, even even share based payments maybe like if they have esop that, that is again a gray area because there yeah. was one case law regarding that the share based payments but then if you think about it share based payments is uh, again linked to performance so yeah, you, you yeah, perform yeah. well then you will get the you know esop or and, whatever and it is uncertain also so will, and right. even gratuity and all you will not know uh, at Correct. that time so they have right. just said monthly remuneration so there was one case where uh, this guy was earning uh, 2 lakh rupees per month but in the end they gave him some 15 lakhs bonus so is that uh, office or place of profit the answer was no because the law says monthly remuneration so that is i mean though it's weird but then you can still sort of break this law by just paying him less than 2.5 lakh and in the end you pay one bulk payment of 10 lakhs 12 lakhs nothing will happen so that is one stupid provision but nevertheless there was a case law also regarding that so that's the meaning of monthly remuneration so I let me just cover the FR part also. Yes, yes. So because he's a managing director, uh, he is said to have been the K K A K M P management personnel. Uh, the whiteboard thing suddenly closed. You have it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so he's a he's a managing director. So he's said to have the K M P. So he's a related party. So for the company Y P L, which is the holding company. Uh, Mr. Sulin Varma is the managing director and managing director is called as the relative for the related party for the purpose of uh, India's uh, 24 related party and it should be disclosed. Interesting point is YPL has got now subsidiary which is SPL. Now the question is whether managing director is a relative of or related party of subsidiary company. India's 24 said Related party means KMP of the company or KMP of the parent company, ultimate parent company. So managing director is not only related to the holding company and managing director is also related to the subsidiary company and therefore managing director's daughter, which is, is also relative and therefore uh, she is also said to be the related party of subsidiary companies. So, for the whole group concerned, uh, they become the related party and, and the disclosure Similar. requirements would fall. Actually, there even in GST also, sir. Yes, it sir. is like being father and daughter, they both are relative and they are related. So, whether dependent or not dependent, spouse and children is always related. They will come under family. And director of a company and the company is also related. So, if the be the case, Sunil Verma and YPL is related. Correct. Then uh, his daughter is appointed as director. So, director and SPL. So, those also. So, means it goes in line even under GST. So, like how you said in FR. So, even GST also, all these four people are actually related. Same. 2 plus 76 also says the same thing, sir. The subsidiary company... Uh, for the subsidiary company, that company is relatives or di director or the relatives and even the holding company is director. So, I think it's synchronized across all the three subjects. So, yeah. by, in, in this, the one, there's one step extra further which goes. Okay. When they talk about definition of relatives, they say relative means spouse, understandable. Then they say children, understandable. 
and they say children of spouse. Oh, step. And they say domestic partner. Okay. And childrens of domestic partners. So is so, that is that are they recognizing the living relationship in that? Those case? things. That's how the terms used in India is twenty four. They India just came from. I mean, yeah. of course, other countries, right? That's yeah, the, domestic partner. Everything yeah. will. Everything. Yeah, will. that that's how they use the word. So they they never recognize. They don't use the word spouse. They just use. I mean, they don't talk about blood relation at all. Right. They only talk about these words because. In those countries, the words like they tell that my child and your child is uh, playing with our child. These are all <laughs> very common terminologies there. That's so why they have Father's Day, Day, Mother's Day, and all that because yeah. they have to figure out who's the father. So, who's that, the mother. Yeah. so that they will not. It's a bad joke, but anyway, that's it. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Goes, so goes. no, we, we, in, on, based on those topics, even in FR, they have not touched upon. I don't mm. know. Maybe they they can ask. So just be aware of those terminologies. Being I mean, then in that case, if living relationships are recognized, I mean, recently one of the Cases I was seeing that uh, even living relationship, you need to get a registration like marriage registration. Yeah, that's what okay. Supreme Court recently said. Supreme Court has told. So I mean, if you add that all this, if you have a domestic partner or the related party, it's registered only means you know domestic partner. It will become then if you link both. Anyway, so yes. who knows? So, Good, so but... let's summarize. Let's summarize this paragraph one. Yeah. So in this paragraph one, what we have seen is mainly related. So that related across all the subjects like a far law, income tax, and GST and customs. So these two companies, YPL and SPL are related. And right. also uh, director and the company is also being related. And uh, mainly uh, Punarvasar has highlighted something about managing director. So is appointed, not necessarily managing director, any person that salary, 2.5 yes. lakhs monthly. Yes. Yes, so sir. these are the aspects. So guys, like whenever the paragraph gets completed, you take one note and uh, you please write down what are the points that we have discussed in that. You just pass the video and you make note of these points and all so that it will be helpful for you because not necessary that this case study may come in exam, but in line of these case study with different questions may also come in exam. So that's why. So a holistic approach is required while preparing. Yes. Yes. So was, I mean, just to give a thing, case study 12 and 13, which Institute has uploaded 13 and 14, 12 and 14, actually, uh, what was uploaded two months ago is different from what is uploaded now. Questions are the same, but I mean, the case study is the same, but questions, they have changed. Correct. So guys like that, they can keep changing. So kindly be alert. Yeah. So uh, when you are making a notes, one suggestion, don't make in a continuous paper, one after another, try to make more structured one. One simple session I can give you is, for example, you're doing for this, you have for, then you give one column for FR, one column for law, one column for income tax, one for GST, and mention the respective section number or whatever the brief points. So you divide the pages in a columnar basis, or if you're writing in Excel or something you can do. So when you're reading it later, you don't have to read continuously. You read the word relative, Against law, against DT, against uh, IDT, and against uh, you know income tax or uh, FMA or if something like that. So multiple columns you maintain. Under that, mention the respective elements. Uh, the two common area which I can definitely foresee is uh, related to the uh, related parties. And whenever the director comes, you will see that things are getting connected. So whenever the problems are related to directors, keep this extra point in mind. All subjects will come together and will haunt you later okay yeah so let's move on to paragraph two and para two is like a very big paragraph let me read and uh Punarva sir can explain in this yes sir. Well, financial year 23 24 ypl appointed chapan and company as its statutory auditor in the place of its previous auditor all the formalities as prescribed by section 139 and 140 Sir will so show or uh, throw some light and were complied with by YPL in relation to such appointment. Also, Chapan and company made a written communication while a registered post acknowledgement due to the previous auditor before accepting such appointment. Yes, sir. So, so yes, sir. yes, sir. So here this is the talking about uh, appointment of a statutory auditor in place of the previous auditor. So, guys, when uh, generally each auditor is appointed for 
five years, as the new law suggests, that is in 2013, which came. The concept of, uh, what do you say, rotation is also there for listed companies and some other unlisted companies as well. So here, we are, let's not talk about rotation because the question does not talk about it. But in case they ask also, you can think about the rotation aspect. Either way, even whether rotation is there or not there, even for example, even for a private company where rotation is not applicable, every auditor cannot be appointed for any number of years like it was there in the previous, uh, you know, before 2013. As of 2013 law, every auditor or audit firm has to be appointed for a maximum period of five years. And it is not up to five years like we saw in MD. MD can be appointed for one year, two year, three years, but statutory order has to be appointed for five years at a time. Five plus five plus five plus five like that. But if rotation is applicable, then it's different. So here what has happened is generally uh, you can replace an auditor at the after five years. So maybe they did not like the previous auditor. So YPL has appointed this uh, Chappan and company uh, for as the new auditors. Now when a new auditor is being appointed, Chappan and company has to uh, do certain things as per auditing, uh, as per professional ethics. One, they should ensure all the formalities of 139 and 140 are followed. So what is 139 and 140? First of all, the previous auditor, uh, you need to ensure that he has been, if he's removed, they have not given whether they have removed or not. So if it's removed, then all the removal provisions of 140 subsection 1 has to be followed. The special resolution, uh, central, that is regional director's approval, all that you need to check. In case he has not been removed, so 140 subsection 1 removal is removal before expiry of the term. So I told you, you can appoint for five years. Before five years only, if I have to, throw out an auditor, let's say first year, second year, third year, then I can go to 140 subsection 1. On the other hand, on the expiry of the fifth AGM, that is five years, on completion of five years, if I have to remove an auditor, that is removal on expiry of the auditor's term, then I have to go to another section called 140 subsection 4. So in this question, they have not given whether it is removal before expiry or removal on expiry. So you can expect questions on those lines. If it is removal before expiry, and if they give you a theoretical question as to what the new auditor should do, I should write the provisions of 140 subsection 1. If it is removal on expiry, then I have to follow 140 subsection 4. So all the entire procedure is there. You have to give a special notice and all those things. So special notice has to be given, uh, you know, not earlier than three months, not less than 14 days. Those are the formalities. All the formalities means that only. Assuming it is removal on expiry, the old auditor completed five years and Chappan and company is the new replacement. Then I have to pass that special notice asking to replace this auditor and the new auditor should come. He should ensure he should also, as per auditing, you should also, professional ethics, you should take a NOC, no objection certificate. And that NOC, even in uh, one of the case studies, there was a thing. Can you send an email as an NOC? No, it should be a written communication and you should give proof that you have sent. So what is the best way? That is RPAD, registered post acknowledgement due. In RPAD, what happens is I will send you the post along with an acknowledgement slip where the receiver will sign on it and send it back. So the postal department will hand over the acknowledgement to you. That is proof enough, evidence in the court of law also saying that you have actually sent it and he has read it. Whether he has read it or not, I don't care. But I have the acknowledgement with me, which means he has read. So all these things, Chappan and company has to take care. Otherwise, the best part is Chappan and company will be liable for professional misconduct. So they will have to bear the brunt of not sending the NOC, etc. So in this question, they have given like that. And now the new guy, Chappan and company, how will they be appointed? They will be appointed by an ordinary resolution. So the board will initially uh, uh, propose and it will go to the audit committee also, if, if at all there's an audit committee. And then they will come to the shareholders in the meeting, in the annual general meeting. And by passing a simple ordinary resolution, the Chappan and company will be appointed. Even the resolution notice has to be given on time, 21 days before the uh, meeting. All these things Chappan and company has to follow. That is the meaning of all the formalities as prescribed by section 139 and 140. All the formalities, that's, those are the formalities. In this question, nothing of the sort has been given. So whatever I told you now in this question is not there. But they can change the question and they can give you other questions. You can write down what are the formalities to be done? What is the professional misconduct points? What will, what will happen if they don't do all these things? Those are the other questions that they can come. So this is the thing, sir. They have not given any question on it, but these are all the items that we can take so, care of. Typically for a financial year 23, 24, they have to be appointed means it would be in the AGM of 20 to 23, right? It would be in the... No, no, no. And for the financial year 23, 24, sir. So AGM will happen... Uh, 
you know in september 24 ha but but the agm for appointment of director has to be previous year no it is for the financial year 23 24 they have to do the audit they have to be there at that time so in the previous agm they would have appointed for the financial year 20 to 23 yeah yeah you are yeah, right if they have to audit 23 24 Like in the AGM, right. connected, maybe in the month of July, August twenty-three, they would have mm. been appointed. Right, right, you're right. right. Yes, because obviously everything you have to do the audit, etc. By end of twenty-four March means by April May you should finish the audit. You should start. So you should, they would have right. appointed yeah, prior to that. So in, in case if some question is asked, like date of sending the notice, those kind of things, if they Good are point. mentioned, yes, yeah, they have to keep it. But the AGM of that uh, first AGM for this Chappan and Company will be September twenty-four. Where they yeah, be... that is where they they, they submit their uh, audited report. Audited report, that, that is yes. Yes. yes, yes, sir. Next pa next pa part in this C A Kailash Chappan, one of the senior partners of the firm, was appointed as the engagement partner by Chappan and Co on such audit assignment of Y P L. While conducting the audit of Y P L, C A Kailash observed that there were certain accounting estimates. made in relation to certain items of financial statements that might give rise to significant risks and thereby he perform substantive procedures in accordance with the requirements of sca 330 that is the auditors responses to assessed risk correct they really related to the audit yeah so yes sir yes so sir basically first of all the auditor has to plan the audit uh and then of course he should assess all the risks so all that planning assessment of risk and acting on those risks is covered in sa 300 315 and 330 so after checking the risks whether you know the internal controls are strong and the other things are covered or not he will now uh, check the estimates like for example a simple example in an insurance company the best uh, accounting estimate will be uh, your done by your actuary that is your actuarial valuation simple words how many people will die this year next year how many people will die what is what will be my outflow from this insurance company what will be my outflow so that is a simple accounting estimate that they have to do so now think as an auditor i i do not i have not studied actuarial valuation actuarial valuation is considered one of the toughest in uh, in the world am i right in my sir i think uh, you had also i, I wrote the no, i wrote the foundation the entrance exam Uh, then uh, i thought the result will come i have to search for website okay. they simply send a email telling please find attached list of people who passed if okay. your name is there you proceed to the next level otherwise try again so it, it is in those very few hundreds actuaries will be there and more often than or not before you come even complete the actuaries you will get some job offer and you end up doing those so only actually, if you not wrong there are uh, 15 papers 16 papers just to digress in that even if you do 7 8 papers also you will get an excellent job uh, because yeah, and I, I, after for passing the foundation i ordered one book then it is still there uh, <laughs> i'm not, not looked after words uh, but so if i'm not wrong there are just around i mean maybe 7 8000 actuaries in india that's it so it's a very Correct. So now, as a why I told you all this, now I am an auditor. How will I know how many people will die? Yeah, that is something that you will know. You will, you are an expert in maths and statistics. So you have made an estimate. Now I should check whether that estimate is correct or not. How would how do I check it? So I need to speak to the uh, what do you say the expert there, the management expert and expert here will be the actuarial valuation uh, guy. And I have to speak to him and saying, sir, what are the assumptions that you have made? So I am giving my practical experience because we were we were the auditors of uh, MetLife. It was MetLife at that time, and ING Vaisha as well. Two insurance companies we audited during my uh, article ship. Uh, we were the statutory auditors, so I personally learned a lot there. So there was one uh, actuary, uh, and all others, as in my sir told, had just finished around seven eight papers. But that lady had finished all the fifteen papers. She was the main actuary. So I remember the discussion with her, and I wanted to understand. because i remember this essay really well because i sat with her and said madam please tell me what are the assumptions that you have made so she gave me an excel sheet which had uh, pages and pages of data and for the life of me i couldn't understand those calculations so i had to go to her and find out so then i came to know they check something called as mortality rate that is the rate of death in india so during covid the mortality rate was higher so obviously there the provisioning should be more then the morbidity rate the date the rate at which the in india people get diseases so that depends on demographics geographical area and many many things very very complex things now as chartered accountant as an auditor i will not get into how she did the calculation but i will get into the assumptions so basically as per sa 540 what i need to really check 
I have to base based on the first I'll do the risk assessment and my entire audit procedure will be based on the assumptions. Is my assumption, I have, I have a set of assumptions, are they matching with the management assumption? And what other alternative assumptions you have made? And what are the most significant assumptions that you have made? And more importantly, I should only check the reasonableness of those assumptions. So generally, if the mortality rate is there, you can get this data from the Statistical Research Institute. There, the mortality rate they've given as, let's say, 30%. But this lady has taken mortality rate of 67%. Is it reasonable or not? That I should check as an auditor. So basically... Uh, uh, I'll in... just add one point to that. Yeah. Uh, because they use the word accounting estimate and this yes. index is full of estimates. Correct. Yeah, Correct. about 80 percent is based on estimation because the one word called as fair value, where they do present value of future cash flows. Mm -hmm. So the moment you talk about present value, so many assumption kicks in, be it from the amount of cash flows or simplest thing being discounting rate. Okay. What should be the discounting rate to be taken? Should Correct. I take the FD rate? Should I take the you know, stock market rate, or should I go for AFM and do the CAPM model discounting rate? So those right. kind of uh, assumptions, yeah, definitely there'll be a lot more uh, to be tested out. No, very good. So basically that's what I'm trying to tell that the estimates will vary from management to management. So I need to do two things here. They have not given in the question, but two other things. One is collect the management representation from them, telling them what all you have done. That is SA 580, collection of management representation, apart from the written representation, Apart from that, I also need, if at all, I am uh, not very happy with uh, this particular valuation, you know, done, I can get my own valuation done from outside. So just to check whether the uh, assumptions taken are reasonable or not. So that is using the work of an auditor's expert. So management expert is that lady who is employed. So if I am not happy with the assumptions, I can hire one more actuary outside and I can compare their assumptions, whether it's correct or not, and give a proper threshold. My entire basis of materiality, which is there in the next para, which is SA320, uh, depends on this. So if you don't mind, I'll, write the, I'll read the next para and then I'll uh, connect it. Uh, yeah. so but, before that, one small question. Yeah. They used one word called as substantive procedures. So right. would you like to throw on that? Like what, what yeah, is yeah. the uh, difference? So substantive basically procedures? it is your entire uh, sampling technique, materiality, and the entire audit procedures. So, for example, there are two things. One is compliance procedure, one more is substantive procedure. Okay. Just to throw some light, compliance procedure means what? Like, for example, if you go to an ATM, uh, now I'm, I'm, I'm throwing this question to Chinmay sir only. If you go to an ATM, uh, what, according to you, should be their internal controls to ensure that cash is not stolen? Very simple question. So, what, according to you, should be there? Uh, the the password management it should connect to my card number properly correct uh, that there will be securities outside security the right. there should be a cctv that's all simple yeah. those are called compliance procedures internal controls whether the internal controls are there or not substantive goes to the next level this is not about internal controls here i'm talking about whether it is rec being recorded in the system properly and whether there are sufficient checks by the management to ensure that there is no defalcation of cash embezzlement of cash mismanagement all these are substantive procedures. So, okay. when I'm doing my planning and risk assessment under 315 and 330, this one, this auditor's response only is that first is I will base it completely out of my compliance procedures. That is the strength of the internal controls. And then I will base my substantive procedures based on the strength of the compliance procedure. So, let's say the company does not even have a very good uh, internal control system at all. Or internal auditors are weird. They, are, they do not give reports properly. So, then I cannot rely on them. So what I should do is I should do my own set of compliance procedures to ensure that the internal controls are in check and then move on towards substantive procedures. So, these so are can things. I say substantive process something like this? Check uh, all the transactions where invoice is crossing 10 crores, something like that. Or can I say uh, I would like to verify all the transactions that took place on last day of the month because in my experience yes. what I've seen companies, hmm. they want to show report to the, the venture capitalist fund the management, they want to show they are achieving the targets. From so 31st, they show more sales and first of next month, they reverse it. Correct. So Correct. actual cash flow is not happening. So I have observed that on 31st of every month, there has been spike in sales. Hmm. And on 1st of every month, there is a return spike. So Correct. maybe these kind of, kind of substantive procedure one right. can observe. But whatever you said, in my sir, is a substantive procedure with materiality. Because with when materiality. you said about okay. 10 crore, you have used something called materiality, which is going to SI320. 
So okay. you will use the material materiality and then done the vouching verification, etc. That is substantive procedures. Whereas okay. if, if the checking the internal controls, see okay. even for example, um, if I am just keeping a cash bundle of cash of ten thousand rupees on my table and I just walk out, or let's say forget about ten thousand, ten rupees on my table and I walk out, somebody can come and take that ten rupees and go, and I am not there. Is the money to material? No, but there is a lapse of internal control here. So internal control doesn't look at Compliance procedures don't look at materiality. Compliance procedures look at the lack of procedure here, lack of controls. So today it can be 10 rupees, tomorrow it can be 10,000, day after tomorrow it can be 1 lakh. There is definitely a problem with the control here, right? Whereas uh, substantive procedures on the other hand is more of your vouching and verification. And along with that, I have to assess the risks based on the assessment of risk which they have given in the question 330 and then go to what? Uh, materiality. My entire, if everything is strong enough, my materiality level will be, okay, let me say 10, you, as you said, more than 10 crore, I will tell. If I feel I'm not very comfortable with the internal controls and I feel that I should lower my materiality level, I should see transactions more than 10 lakhs and not 10 crore. So it all depends on the assessment of risk and how I respond to those risks. So that is what they have given here in this particular question. That if you see, there are certain accounting estimates made in relation to certain items of financial statements that might give rise to significant risk. So he is not very happy with the assumptions that the management has made. That's why he is performing more substantive procedures in response uh, to SAP. Can I, can, I, can I say like this? When they say that might give rise to significant risk and risk about him forming an opinion, that is yes. the risk they are talking yes. about going, yes. being, yes. going wrong. Right. He, he might give a clean report, but there might be some issue there. That's yes, the very good. Perfect. That is always the risk. That is always the risk. So based on that, he will have to do, do the material edit, which is the next para. So I'll just read that. So further, CA Kailas determined that there are certain factors that indicated the existence of certain transactions entered into by YPL for which misstatement of lesser amounts than materiality for the financial statements as a whole could reasonably be expected to influence the economic decisions of users taken on the basis of the financial statements and accordingly Kailash has lowered the materiality level. So as you said, there may be a lot of transactions in the end of the year, maybe small, small amounts. In isolation, they may not be material. But if I add everything together, definitely it will uh, be a huge amount and it will definitely probably change the way the economic decisions of users are taken because I may give a clean report, but ideally I should have given a qualified opinion. So this materiality check has to be done. For example, related party transaction. You are my related party, I'll give you 10 rupees. Rupees, I mean, as far as amount is concerned, it's nothing. But if you see the materiality here concerned, it is my related party. Today it can be 10, tomorrow like that I can give it to many such related parties and then it will be significantly material. So remuneration to managerial personnel, Remuneration to audit committee, because audit committee is looking after the governance mechanism of the company. If I'm giving some extra payment to them, amount may be very less, but will it re result in them giving a bad decision? Uh, something which will impact the users of financial saving, that is ultimately the stakeholders is what I need to see. Then, of course, the uh, I, I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm in a normal company and I've done a lot of uh, R&D this year. R&D amount may be you know, less, it may be huge, whatever, but have I disclosed it very clearly in the thing? And I may have taken over a very small business. It may be immaterial. I'm a 1,000, 10,000 crore business. I would have taken one business for one crore. But is it significant in such, such a thing that it's a newly uh, acquired business and it will have far-reaching consequences in the future? Uh, to give an example, Reliance, around nine years ago only, they bought a company which was only into manufacturing sodium. So the company itself was manufacturing sodium and it had around 70-80 uh, patents already. And Ambani, Mukesh Ambani bought it for peanuts, for peanuts actually. Today, that company is valued at such a great scale because lithium ion, now EV, electric vehicles, lithium ion, everybody is using lithium ion. Lithium ion is scarce product. It will go away in a few years. The only replacement of lithium ion is uh, sodium. So this guy had the vision nine years ago to buy that, you know, sodium company which had 94 patents or something which in, in sodium technology. He's already acquired it. You will see in the next 10 years how things will change. Lithium ion will deplete and sodium. So at that point of time only, even though I have bought it for peanuts, I should disclose it separately. So all these things, the amount, who will decide? 
auditor will decide to check. So misstatements of lesser amounts in isolation, it may be nothing. But in, in if you aggregate everything, it may be huge. So that auditor has to check. Now, how much percentage, etc., nobody knows. That is why we have a concept of professional judgment. In our SA 200, they only clearly mention professional judgment. It is based on your judgment and your judgment alone, nothing else. So, your judgment, you feel I have to lower the materiality level, I have to do. So, and these they two use the questions word something are, like uh, persuasive evidence and not a conclusive evidence, right? That's perfect, what they perfect, perfect. So, it's your evidence that you're collecting also is persuasive because it is dependent on various factors like your professional judgment. Now, that is the reason why NFRA is coming now, National Financial Reporting Authority. They are telling your judgment only is wrong. Like you're not even checking the basic stuff. I will not uh, penalize you if you had applied that professional judgment. But if you have not applied, then that is what it is. That's what they say. So all yeah. audit related stuff, guys. So it's yeah, important. I'll just add one point because they, they have defined the materiality here, uh, ah. which is the definition as per index also, that, but they've changed recently a small thing. So if mm. you read this sentence, they say, uh, materialities which could reasonably be expected to influence economic decision of the users, Correct. which is what they have used it. Uh, they are slightly modified in index one. They are okay. calling it as information is material if omitting, misstating, or obscuring it could reasonably expected to influence the decision of the primary users. So they have used okay. the one word called primary users. Okay. And they have used the word like omitting, misstating. So if you choose, if you forgot to show something or if you by knowingly show you different amounts, so those are all coming under the definition of materiality. So from exam point of view, it may not mean much, but because for you to solve FR, they'll give you a question, you'll solve it. But you should be aware of this amendment that has taken place as far as uh, India's one and IFRS one is concerned. That interesting word, obscuring. Obscuring yeah. also is the same thing that, you know, hiding yeah, you, yeah, you decide like window dressing or whatever people call it. Like you choose not to show them purposefully, knowing the fact that some data was uh, known to you earlier. So those kind of words they have introduced. So it may not mean in exam, but it will definitely have impact in the real life when you prepare the financial statement. So primary yeah. users will be shareholders and creators, right? Yeah, uh, that's the okay, definition not given, but primary will be for the users, will be shareholders and uh, I think uh, the government where the taxation would be considered over there. Yeah. So uh, one more small example I'll take. Uh, again, uh, small, slightly different thing. You may also give your opinion. Yeah. So if a company sells goods at 100 rupees, but to acquire customer, they're giving a discount of 40 rupees. And they're selling at 60 rupees. Now the question is, what is the turnover of the company? Is it 100 or is it 40? Uh, 100. 100 only. Uh, Right. But they're giving discount, no? But when you give discount instantly, they're not collecting the like money. Trade discount sort of a thing. Trade discount kind of thing. But what they're doing is they were paying on 100 GST hmm. and they're add a GST, 100 no, plus 18 no. minus 40. GST rupees. purpose, it is 60. Ah, no, no. They were paying GST also, the company what I'm trying to talk about. Oh, they're paying they're GST. Paying 100 on, on that 18, then 40. Because they, the, the reason why they're not, first, they were not aware of the law. Second, they could show more sales. No, they mm -hmm. can. These are initial companies. They can say valuation. I can get. They can do PE valuation. I'm making more sales. My growth is happening. Then we have to convince them that it is not the case. You have to show only at sixty rupees, and you get the benefit of GST or discount also. So those mm -hmm. are the risk that you might have taken. So when you go and check, when they give you tally report, SAP report, just don't blindly take them. Look at these possibilities. Are the discounts shown at net basis or gross basis? And is there a policy behind it? And these are all the risks which could be significant, which Punar uh, was mentioning earlier. You can also give these examples, especially in auditing paper, when you're writing an examination. Interesting. Uh, yes. Yes, because actually what Punar sir said is isolated. If you see, it may be a small amount, yes. but comprehensively, when you see overall, so this is going to become a big amount. So yes. And even accounts-wise, we have something called as contingent liabilities, mm. where it is yet to be decided. For example, mm. for Delta Corp, uh, GST case happened, right, for the gaming, which yes. a couple of months back. The amount of notice what they received is more than the market cap of the company. company. Right. So right. if, if they have to make a provision, company value would be negative. So those right. are the significant risks, which whether they're right. provided or not, we have to check. Okay.
and also we are always online gaming recently in the previous budget they uh, brought it under the tax net also so all the earnings from your uh, online gaming your all the even even dream 11 got some 40000 40000 uh, crore yeah, yeah whoever is associated with bcci everyone comes up paytm ha ah, yeah yeah dream yeah. 11 all those things that's that's cursed i think that's <laughs> cursed cursed bcci yeah yes Yes. So, so Chinmayer can read the next two paras yes, because we get to GST and yeah. I'll read. I'll read it and yeah, I'll yeah. explain. So apart from conducting the audit assignment, Mr. Kailash also used to solve the concerns raised by the accountant of YPL with respect to GST and income tax matters. One such concern raised by the accountant to him was the uh, uh, respect to ITC availment and the GST. which is briefed as under i'll read that part also the balance of itc itc is not the you know okay. itc limited it is uh, input tax credit they can use the shortcuts like this but i don't know whether we can use in exams the balance of itc with ypl after discharging of gst liability for april month was rupees 60 lakhs eligible itc reflected in gstr 2b with respect to may month of ypl was 56 lakhs whereas input tax paid by it on the invoices received during the month of may was rupees 75 lakh and the output tax liability for the month of may was rupees 110 lakhs so he was not sure about the amount of itc to be availed for the month of may for which he consulted ca kailash and after following his advice gst liability for the month of may was discharged by ypl fully throughout fully through the balance in electronic ledger electronic uh, Great ledgers only. So I'll give you suggestion for this. So take the suggestion of the own sir. <laughs> so you take it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, so actually, here there are multiple aspects which I wanted to explain one by one. First one is section forty one, read with rule thirty six sub rule four. So what does it says? Previously, when Arun Jaitley has given ITC. Like uh, the concept of GST was so nice. So what they said is that a seamless flow of credits. Like whatever you buy, on that you pay tax. You take that and adjust against the tax that you need to pay in future. This how it started. And uh, thereafter, many people have misused this provision. Like whether they paid the tax or not on their purchases, they made a fake invoices. Like they have procured it and uh, whims and fancies they entered the numbers. and they availed the itc and all then the next thing that came was the matching so whenever you are taking the itc that should match with the supplier's liability so if it is not matching then you cannot take itc like that then they have brought in the concept and at that time initially what they said is that uh, okay if your supplier has made a mistake it's okay no issue whatever is matching matching here refers to whatever itc as per your invoice should be paid by your supplier in his liability mm. so that is matching so even if it is not matching we are giving you 20% allowance you take the extra credit gradually chechi came like nirmala sitaraman came Nandi. and uh, so she reduced it to 10 then 5 and now in this rule 36 of rule 4 Only match the ITC can be availed. Okay. Only match zero okay. percent. No, no deviation allowed. No deviation. No error. Nothing. So now, why it will not match? Three reasons. Reason number one, my supplier has not filed GSTR one. So okay. GSTR one is a return which will be filed by the supplier. From GSTR one, the data will come in GSTR two B. So GSTR one is not in my hands. My supplier hands. And GST R two B that is as a recipient, so I will get only two B. Whatever it will be filed by tenth or something, right? By GST R one yes. will be GST R eleven will be filed by GST R eleven will be filed by eleventh of next month. Eleventh, okay. Eleventh of next month. Whereas GST R three B we will get it two B we will get it by thirteenth of next month. Okay. Today, so today they will take it for processing. Okay. Sorry. Yes. So by end of today, like thirteenth, uh, we will be getting this. So this it is in to be whatever is there that much only I can take. Now why will there be a difference between the it is as per my books versus it is as per GSTR to be? 
because my supplier has not filed GSTR 1 on time. That is by 11th, he should have filed. If he has not filed by 11th, if he filed it after 11th, this will come in next month to be. So not, you know, for example, January GSTR 1, he should file by 11th of February. If he files on 12th February or 13th February, etc., it will not come in to be of January. It will come in to be of February, which will be made available to me in March. Mm -hmm. So reason number one, supplier not file GSTR 1. Reason number two, supplier filed GSTR 1 on time, but he did not report my invoice. That is whatever I purchased. He mm -hmm. missed. Reason number three, he filed GSTR 1 on time. He reported the invoice, but that invoice information is wrong. Maybe I purchased for 10 lakhs plus 18% GST. He showed 10 lakhs plus 12% GST. So because of which there will be a mismatch between whatever it is that is there in my books versus 2B. So here what has happened is that input tax credit paid by it on invoices received during the month of May was 75 lakhs. Means based on their books, input tax credit was 75 lakhs. But what was reflected in 2B for May month was only 56 lakhs, which mm. means how much can be taken as ATZ? 75 56 or 56, lakhs, only 56 lakhs. 56 correct. Then, then this remaining difference, what will happen? So we will be carried forward. Then. Yeah, yeah. Ah, no, not carried forward. First, we cannot take the credit. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. we cannot take the credit. Now we need to appoint one accountant or the bonded labor in the audit firm. <laughs> and they will be doing follow-up. So they okay. will call uh, the supplier. Say, for example, I am the client. So article student will be appointed for my work. He will call my suppliers and ensure that they are filing GSTR1. And sir, it goes to what extent you know. So they will ask my suppliers login details and they will add the invoices. I will only do it. You don't worry, basically. You don't worry. <laughs> so article students right. life made hell because of this. So now, because they cannot afford the accountant, because right. accountant salary you have to pay 15,000 rupees at least. Our fellows, 2,000, 3,000. 3,500, 3,000 rupees. So anyhow, we have cheap labor. So using the cheap labor, we can make use. Sir, so that, like, that's actual, I see differently. So that's a business opportunity for the article to uh, practice after passing the examination. You can uh, do a client relationship. Correct. So therefore, okay. these people will be you know, daily, literally like how customer yeah. care calls call suppliers accountant and we will ensure that this difference gets reported in GSTR 1 so mm -hmm. that we will be getting it because it's a huge amount 75 mm -hmm. versus 56 lakhs is a huge amount right. therefore uh, the client will but, but in the accounts I would have shown as input credit yes. so input credit. accounting the 75 lakhs is shown as asset input tax credit mm -hmm. but really 56 lakhs is only the input tax credit this we need to reconcile and show at the end in annual return. Okay, so auditor would have gone mad comparing these two if we don't know how the GST works. <laughs> okay. So okay. that's where no, I, I, on annual return and all, they have removed for up to two crores. If your turnover is up to two crores, you don't have to file annual return and all because this is like Herculean task, invoice okay. to invoice mapping, okay. softwares and all we need to install. Even then it will not work because these softwares will sometimes not properly match because no, no, no. All yeah, correct, exactly. No, no, for even alphabet missing, they'll put that slash hyphen. Correct. By typing, they would have put one space. Because technical right. guys will not understand what we need. They develop right. software. In that software, they keep a number of validation tools. So this, this is the challenge. So here in this case, for this person, because they asked one question. So they are not sure about the amount of ITG to be available for the month of May. So only 56 lakhs can be availed for the month of May, but mm -hmm. not 75 lakhs. Okay. And uh, one more question is this. GST liability for the month of May was discharged by YPL fully through its balance in electronic credit ledger only. So here, if you see, already some opening balance was 60 lakhs. Mm -hmm. Already opening balance was 60 lakhs. And, and now, as per, uh, as per this uh, rule 56. 36B, uh, section 41, we can take only 56. 56. Yeah, total we get 116. Ah, so therefore, 116 lakhs is the input tax credit available. Whereas, payable is 110, I think. Yeah. Their liability is 110. So their question is correct. Sir, I have 116 lakhs. So I need to pay 110 lakhs. Can I use fully my electronic credit ledger? 
Now, again, there is one more rule which has restricted this. Rule 86B. This is rule this, 86B. This is not crime, sir. This is cruel. <laughs> cruel. Now, I'll tell you what cruel I'll tell you in this. Rule 86B came during COVID. Actually, what happened? Before COVID, we made a lot of purchases. Everyone made purchase regularly thinking that there will be sales. But COVID came out of surprise. February month, February 2020, March 2020, COVID came out of surprise. Now, what we did for six months, uh, we clapped, uh, light the candle. Uh, so, <laughs> this is what we did. We didn't do any... And the vessels. Yeah. Uh, vessels and all, we clapped. Uh, so, we didn't do any economic activity. Thereafter, after six months, what has happened? Slowly, they gave relaxations. Like, morning, two hours, you can open. Evening, two hours, you can open. Like that. And now, uh, what has happened? My credit was high. Because I have made huge purchases. My credit Correct. was... But my liability will be small because I'm not making that much of sales. Mm -hmm. Now, using my credit, I will wipe off my liability naturally. If I do that, there is loss of revenue to the government. In a sense, the government will not have cash inflow. Right. Because credit I took and I adjusted here. So there is no cash inflow. Already government spent huge amount on COVID relief. And now they don't have funds. So to create the cash inflow to the government, they mm -hmm. brought this rule 86B. And they are telling, out of your gross liability, you hmm. pay 1% through cash, cash okay. ledger. Okay. Even though you have sufficient balance in the credit ledger. This, this is like almost begging, sir. Sorry. Begging <laughs> or almost begging. I used to tell the same. It is almost <laughs> begging. So, okay. yeah, give one rupee, please. <laughs> like that. So, 1% of the gross liability they are collecting from cash ledger even though I have sufficient balance in input tax credit. So this input tax credit to take itself, how much challenge I had, so I need to match, then only I take. This 56 lakhs is my money, my bloody money. But mm -hmm. to use this money also, there is a restriction like 1% I have to pay through the cash ledger. Sir, and that rule is still there, sir. Even after COVID, they could ah, have... Exactly. No. This is criminal. This is cruel. Yeah. You brought it. There is a reason to bring it. But what is the reason to continue it? So, There's, like this, one more cruelty was there. Those yeah. This, those who are listening to this, don't comment. Tarun sir is yeah. against BJP. There is nothing <laughs> here related to BJP or Congress. So, yeah. even if it is Congress or BJP, the fact is fact. Yeah. And the policy which we are talking about. So, I'm not taking sides. I'm just explaining the scenario what is happening today. Why traders are getting affected is what I am explaining. I am talking on behalf of traders. And of course, because of this, I will not get claims also. So I understand. <laughs> that's what, sir. Otherwise, that's a very sensitive. The people will tell this fellow is right, left, the center, and all that. So I'm yeah. not, I'm neither <laughs> left, the center. I'm not Indian also. Leave it now. No, no <laughs> we, we are, we are Marxist, sir. We are Marxist. We believe in Marx. We yes, want sir. Marx for students. <laughs> that's all. Oh, oh, that's Marxist, sir. Good, not good. Marx, <laughs> yes. <laughs> then they'll tell Karl Marx and all that. Yeah. yeah. Not, not communist, not that. <laughs> Oh, we will. We are talking about this. So coming back to this, cash. Uh, just, just to add, because you told that thing, not directly but indirectly, uh, when the stock market transaction happening for a long period of time in India, capital gain tax was not there, neither long term nor short term, especially long term. So they have introduced this concept of STT, security transaction tax. Yeah, correct. Basically, because capital gain tax was not there. Now you correct. have short term capital gain. You have long term capital gain. You have STT also. STT also. Okay. Correct. All that's the that's the fun in India. To bring a law, there is a reason. But mm, to yeah. continue the law, there is no reason. There is no reason. Yeah. Because the opposition should be strong. Right. Opposition should speak now. Nah, something they need to understand. If they are not understanding anything, what we can do? So here, this is a fate of traders today. So this example literally suits here. Even though they have 116 lakhs, but they cannot use entire 116 lakhs to pay 110 lakhs, which means... 110 lakhs into 1%. What is that? 110 lakhs into 1%, 1 lakh 10,000. They have to pay by cash and remaining amount only they can adjust from the credit ledger. Yes. Gross amount, not even net amount. Okay. Yeah, gross. 110 <laughs> lakhs. Even more higher. But this is applicable not for all, only for those people whose monthly turnover, hmm. monthly turnover exceeds 50 lakhs, which means annually it is like 6 crores. Mostly majority are covered. Mm -hmm. are easier now. It is six crores turnover. We are talking about 200 crores, 300 crores, lakhs of crores. 
So this monthly more than 50 lakhs, it will be applicable. Who knows, lot of uh, you know CA faculties in North uh, are crossing this turnover of monthly 50 lakhs. So yeah. we should also cross, sir. Guys, with your blessings, we will also cross sooner. So <laughs> touch wood. So therefore, you know, this way, if monthly turnover is more than 50 lakhs, for them only 86B is applicable. Okay. So just one more small thing, not directly related. Uh, these construction companies, no, when they especially sell it to the individual people, they used to ask, do you want uh, with invoice, without invoice? Obviously, individuals say, I don't want invoice. Mm -hmm. So this construction company's input credit used to increase. Output credit was not increasing at all, yeah. but they're not showing the same. Removed input tax credits for construction companies. Construction they not there. Yeah. Nirmala ma'am is there, na. I don't know <laughs> about anything, but this and all, she's very intelligent. Very, yeah. very intelligent. So maybe she has appointed one team to identify who are all evading. Again, 100%. You know, she took the cement and pasted those loopholes. So it is like, you know, what has happened is that all construction companies are doing this. One right. shot, one stroke, I'm reducing, like rate is reduced to 7.5% without ITC. Which don't take it. ITC. Oh. And rate was 18% with ITC. Oh, and half percent. Yeah, now 7.5% without ITC. Now buyer is thinking there is a reduction in rate. But only mm. we will tell there is no reduction in rate actually. When he is not getting ITC, he will add it to the cost. Mm. Yeah. So, so but buyer, when, it, when it came, sir, approximately? like 2019. First 19, came, okay. 2019. Okay. Exactly, <laughs> that was a sixer during uh, election. This <laughs> okay. elections. So oh, what okay. has happened is that so this uh, amendment came and every buyer thought, wow, 7.5%, great. So 18% to 7.5%. But this with ITC, without ITC, no idiot will understand here. Correct. So yeah. uh, or they thought it is like that. They started putting pressure on the builders. Builders and are literally cried. Their ITC is gone. Mm. And customers started putting pressure. Why are you not reducing the price of the flats? Right. So it's like literally right. it is the worst for them. Correct. Yes. So, guys, see if you see just five lines, so many, so many things are there, and uh, beautifully explained by Tarun sir. This is the beauty of IBS. Uh, it's gonna any question can come from anywhere. So we need to be very, very careful about it. What I explained is only from this aspect, sir. What really, whatever they asked, this, these two are really tested here in the question. No, no, I what I'm trying to tell is, sir, I mean, su such a big explanation only for like three, four lines. So ah, exactly. yeah, 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 yeah. Anything they can ask, like every line we can speak for us is what I'm saying. So they can ask anything under the sun. Correct, correct. Which is what I'm doing. Yes. So para three, let me but, read. But the intensity, sir, actually, no, this is one chapter, sir. Hmm. This only match that is can be taken is one chapter. One chapter. Hmm. Input tax credit chapter. Mm -hmm. And this rule 86B is actually another chapter, payment process okay. chapter. So, actually, in I IBS itself is conglomeration of chapters. All, sub all subjects. Yeah. In that, see, multiple chapters also, they are connecting. Yeah, yeah. And in law, I, I thought only company law, sir, they are giving FEMA, SEBI, they are PMLA, FCRA. FCRA is there. FCRA. FCRA is what I'm saying. So, I mean, economic law also, they are adding. It was only company law. Is that actually what I genuinely thought when before starting the subject, but everything is us, so... Maybe you know, if you have to put this on a slightly positive note, I can say like those people who pass this exam in coming out would be better than maybe my quality when I pass the examination. 100%. That is 100%. Like this, sir. Always in C8 is like that. The fresher is in more demand than the experienced. Very true. So because they, the, they, they learn many things, latest things and all. So that's why, you know, CAs and all, it's like as you grow older, your earnings will increase. No, nothing of that sort. So people who are younger only, they are earning nicely than the old people. Correct. Right. So guys, uh, some of you, one of you had commented, you know, which was recorded again, I'm just again telling because it's going on YouTube, saying that uh, you have to discourage this subject and you know, you are, let's see if one of you can write all the subjects, etc. Or basically, the idea of this entire IBS was each of us are expert in our own area and we want to come together and learn from each other and also discuss stuff with you and i just want to tell you that ultimately this is the truth we you are becoming global chartered accountants and rather than fighting this subject embrace it and study as simple as that so there's no point in um, commenting like you only write the exam can you write the exam alone we have already passed i'm sorry to say but we have already passed and as i'm as chinmay sir already mentioned you guys are way smarter than us than we had passed i always tell it in class 
you guys are way way smarter uh, and of... exactly don't compare with us because tomorrow yeah. you are going to become successful and you are going to earn lots and lots of money as uh, you are going to pay 40% of your earnings to us so then why why you compare uh, with yourself with us so we are there to provide you as a ladder we are ladder always a ladder so uh, but you are going to climb up so therefore you think about yours and don't tell like uh, tarun sir should <laughs> learn all the subjects and uh, <laughs> Our Punarvas sir should all learn. No, but I cannot do that. Already see, completely gone. Then what? <laughs> so there is nothing left here. So please try to. Yeah. All right. Yes. So the final fight, guys. Yeah. So I'll, let me take uh, para number three because uh, it has again CSR aspects. So guys, see, we have already finished more sir, than. I'll read, this, sir. I'll read. You can throw yes, some. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please go ahead, sir. YPL provides donation every year as a part of its CSR activities. Mm. Charitable trust named Siksha Kalyan Trust. So about this CSR, Punarvas sir will throw some light yes. because already we did one case study yeah. in that uh, in detail we have covered CSR, but few aspects of the CSR will be touched upon. Yes. Engaged in activities of providing education to poor children. The average net profit of YPL for the past three years was 88 crores. Accordingly, during current financial year, that is during financial year 23-24, it made a donation of 2 crores to SKT as its CSR spend. SPL, right. it's a subsidiary. Okay, so I will stop up to this. We'll stop here, sir. So, uh, good. So, uh, First of all, CSR is given in section 135 of the Companies Act. So as per 135 of the Companies Act, I mean, this was one of the sections which came in 2013, which created a hue and cry that time. So as per this section, it's very simple. You have to spend, it is mandatory for you to spend at least 2% of your average net profits of the past three years. So in this case, they have given that past three years profit as 88 crore. Now, if they had given the three years profit separately, you need to add all the three and divide it by a three. That's it. Now, what if there is a loss is one more question. You need to consider the loss because income includes loss as well. So basically, this 88 crore will be the average profits after adding, subtracting income, losses, everything and divide by three. This is the average 88 crore. So as per CSR provisions 135, you need to spend 2%, 2% of 88 crore, which comes to roughly around 1.82 crore, which they have done if you see. Accordingly, during current financial year, it made a donation of 2 crore to SKT as its CSR spent. That is fine. They have to do it. Every company has to do it. Holding company has to do it separately. Subsidiary company has to do it separately. It's not like for entire group company I will do. Based on your standalone profits, you need to do. So this has to be done. Uh, that is one point. Second point is a CSR can be done through various NGOs or you can have your own companies and that is called Section 8 company. Under, in, uh, under company law, if you register a Section 8 company, it is a charitable organization where you can definitely uh, carry out the CSR activities through these Section 8 companies. Or, I mean, you will get the deduction either this or you have to register under 12 capital A of Income Tax Act, where you will get a ADG certificate to do all those activities. Now, what will uh, be called as CSR activities? We have a particular schedule in our Companies Act which speaks about what are all the CSR activities. So it can be poverty alleviation. It can be in this particular case, education to poor children, uh, sewage and uh, environmental protection. So many things are there. Based on that only, you should do CSR. These one day activities like uh, your TCS has this one day run, one day marathon, all this will not be covered. Uh, similarly, if for example, if I have a, a solar paneling, Chinnaswamy Stadium has run solar pan paneling uh, for the entire stadium. Though it has spent only for itself, it is actually saving electricity and the electricity is being used to electrify two villages in uh, Kolar, KGF, Kolar Goldfields. So basically, essentially, you have to see the facts of the case. All these will be CSR. So in this question, that has happened. Now, can I also take money from outside, donation from outside and do it? Yes. But should I spend money outside in the sense, can I, can one company in India spend money outside India? Can I donate it to some Singaporean trust? That is not possible because CSR, you have to endeavor to obviously spend, spend in India. Objective is India only. That is the reason why CSR came. So in that regard, this entire provision they have given. So 88 crore into 2 percent is roughly around 2 crore, which they have already spent. Mind you, 2 crore is minimum. Can you spend little more also if you want? Yes. There is also now a slightly carry forward benefit, etc. will be given. 
you can carry it forward to many we'll see that years that is not relevant now apart from that can you like uh, spend less so can i just spend 1 crore is the question the answer is no for that also there are uh, provisions where you need to uh, what what would be the consequence if i don't spend just want to understand like <laughs> so earlier now there is a fine earlier mm -hmm. that this fine came just 2 years ago earlier it was just either comply or explain in the notes to account explain in the board report explain okay. the board report so now there is a fine and also there is a general penalty clause of 50000 rupees if you uh, don't do it apart from that there is nothing much no because Basically, if i have to spend uh, 5 crore maybe maybe beneficial to pay fine itself instead of that is okay. so when this sad. provision came no the person who was laughing at this provision was ratan tata because ratan tata ji actually donates almost 40 50 percent of his company's uh, thing into csr anyway so this two percent is peanuts but then if you don't spend this two percent it will uh, obviously you the companies will lose space because i mean in the capitalistic economy you are earning so much can't you just donate two percent back to society is the question so they are telling you you let's say if you are you run a hospital it's okay for your employees also and for outsiders also no problem but try to donate is what this section the intention of the section is you have to do it Though there is no hard and fast tool, but now, of course, uh, fine mm -hmm. uh, is there, but it's peanuts. So, as you said, it's a few lakhs of rupees. So, even if yeah. you don't spend, you can pay that lakhs and close it. But yes. So it's it's uh, more of a non-finance impact than a financial thing to be looked at. And more of, you know, it may impact financially also indirectly because... Brand, brand gets yeah, a brand. brand yeah, value. the brand overall. Otherwise, yeah. But yeah, right. as such, it's not a you know addition on which is right. beneficial. Yes. Right. I just wanted to add one point. Yes, point. So usually in input tax credit in GST, there is something called as blocked credits. Yes. So which means uh, on certain expenditures, even though it is business expenditures, the GST paid cannot be taken as input tax credit. And Finance Act 2023, they made an amendment. So wherein this particular CSR expenditure under 135. So in this case, they are making a donation. So but usually they can spend money for CSR. When they are spending money, means they can procure certain things. Say, for example, if they want to distribute some uh, clothes or uh, certain things to the poor people, so for that they will procure. On the procurement, there might be a GST component. So that okay. GST component cannot be taken as credit. Okay. In tax credit cannot be taken. And uh, whether it's a business expenditure or non-business expenditure, we don't have to probe into it. So simply they have kept it under block credit. Yes. Okay. So... And, uh, also, one more thing in income tax, if I make a spend of this 2%, like in this example, 2 crore, will it be allowed as a deduction? The answer is no. Because if I allow it as a deduction, it will be like, what do you say, subsidizing the donation. I am paying to 2, two crore and then taking it as an expense and earning 30% uh, tax benefit out of it. So, CSR spends are not, uh, you know, uh, what so do you say, allowable. It is, a, it is a form of tax itself, you can say. Correct. CSR is yes. another name for tax. It's not so you, benefit. The same point in income tax also, you should not earn any benefit. GST also, you should not earn any benefit out of it, which means completely yeah. it should be like purely donation out of Correct. that. Yeah, basically means when you say donation, don't expect anything back. Correct. <laughs> the, that, that's the meaning of it. Yeah. So in 21, I think there were some provisions were changed also, I told you a couple of years ago, where uh, they told even officer in default, that is all the directors, uh, the CFO, etc., they also will be liable. They have to transfer like one tenth of the amount which you have not transferred to a separate fund all those provisions came but ultimately as you said if a company is, has to spend 200 crores with a mere few crores etc you can escape this but yeah the objective is what we need to see yes so in that regard uh what they have told here is uh, spl it's subsidiary company subsidiary company also wants but singapore company also wants to make a donation to such trust in india during the same financial year now however SKT certificate of registration, SKT is that Shiksha Kalyan Trust, they are doing it through a trust. That certificate of registration under FCRA, because now what is happening, the Singapore company is donating money to this trust, SKT. So obviously when money is coming from outside India to our country, you have to follow a law called FCRA, Foreign Contribution Regulation Act. So FCRA was initially inserted in 1976, immediately after emergency by Srimati Indira Gandhi. Syllabus, sir. There yes. Is... yes, sir. It was there in, in the old law, paper four. A uh, little bit was there. It, hardly they were asking, but uh, you know, they were asked, it's very, very important law even for our future as well. Even but in but is it there in SPOM that the SPOM set? In SPOM, very, very little, very little is there. It's there. But, but it's the so syllabus wise. 
there so they can't we can't say out of syllabus it is no, definitely okay. they basically if you study ibs this one you can easily finish uh, spom or if you okay. finish spom set a if you uh, do the classes and all that then you can uh, easily you can you know handle these uh, issues now this is one question they can give any question under the sun for csr right sorry for uh, fcra under fcra okay. so you need to be careful so if you see fcra 2010 but initially it came in 1976 immediately after emergency the reason why it was inserted only is different uh, that time uh, i mean just to give up because it's important in the context so that time uh, of course the country was controlled by cia and kgb cia being the central intelligence agency of usa and kgb of russia so basically kgb was supporting congress at that time so indira gandhi did not want any money to come to from cia from usa to india to support other parties like the jan sang and all that that is the reason why she came about with fcra where complete prohibition of uh, money except where it is approved so all the registration was given only to companies from russia honestly speaking but over the years it has gone through so many things and both bjp congress all that did not tweak it to their advantage and now we are standing at fcra 2010 the main objective being that any foreign fund should not be used for conversion activities religious conversions and also for uh, prevention of this terrorism there is activities should not happen that's the reason why it has come so all these ngos etc have to register with the uh you know fcra authority you have to get it get yourself registered registration will be valid for 5 years now can you renew the certificate you can renew the certificate when before 6 months when it is expiring so it's expiring uh, at the end of 5 years at 4 and a half years you can do the renewal the renewal also will be for 5 years but if you miss that thing before the expiry if you miss it out then you obviously you will have to do some other procedures etc one major change which has not been given in this question but they can ask it is can one trust for example shiksha kalyan trust can they take money it is a registered entity can it take money yes it can if it's registered now can it give the money to one more registered institute? let's say chinmaya trust is there can i donate that money to chinmaya trust the answer till recently was yes but there was a huge amendment where they said the section 6 and 7 of uh, fcra they said that a registered entity cannot transfer money to any other registered entity also so it is barred now it is not possible so earlier they, it was allowed now not possible second important change is any money coming into india of all these trusts should first come into account maintained in sbi delhi branch only delhi they have given a main branch sbi main branch delhi all ngos should register the account there Uh, open an account there money should come only there first from there you can divert it to all your other accounts which are registered so that also government wants control as to where the money is coming from so during covid it, it this amendment came and it created a huge problem because as you know sbi the other name is sleeping bank of india so they were not opening accounts only so we did we could not get donations from outside to help indians in covid so people uh, nris wanted to donate lot of money to the country but through ngos but it was not possible to do so anyway in this one the is that even the you know swiggy delivery boy went to deliver the food to yeah. our employee there and the employee told now it's the lunch time come lunch later time go yeah yeah that is sbi sleeping <laughs> bag there yes. yeah. so sbi is my favorite example in classes because any case law you see first will be the petitioner will be sbi yeah from no, harshad mehta case i think from harshad mehta always sbi wherever even in ibc insolvency bankruptcy court the main uh, financial creditor will be sbi so that's yeah. how it is anyway so one question uh, will that that uh, renewal fee or the amount you pay will it be significant because if i think from accounting angle should i recognize over five year period or one year 5000 rupees 5000 okay i think yeah. then it so, will not be much of thing yeah, to uh, yeah so so here <laughs> 20th december 2023 so basically six months before only you can do uh, december means like what what would be six months August, August, September, October, November. Yeah, around August, July, August. You, to, you can from there only you can start. But if you don't do within that time, gone. And it had not applied for renewal of certificate before that. As the head accountant believes that they could apply for renewal within one year from the expiry. Now this is wrong. He has created his own FCRA. That is the problem. And hence, pending or the trustee decide to make an application for renewal, so the trust can accept donation. And the same was done as per relevant legal problem. So of course you need to pay that five thousand rupees and all that. And there are some couple of forms you need to fill, and you will get the registration done. So regarding that, the same question is that we are actually discussing the answers also now. Honestly, 
but when the questions come we'll quickly finish it off in like 30 30 seconds yes 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 moving yes. ahead para for maybe chama uh, sir can read because i think it's fully related to gst uh, no it is gst yes, yeah, i can read it yeah for yeah. read so uh, ypl bought a machinery from dusham limited for its business for which ypl received a government grant of 6 lakh i think fr also will come fr is also there yes yeah for government grant of 6 lakhs the details machinery are as follows list price of the machinery exclusive of tax and discount uh, corrugated boxes used for packing the equipment not included in the price above 60000 discount of 2% offered on the list price of the machine recorded in the invoice of the machine as part of its policy ypl depreciates its plant and machinery at 20% on state land basis and also does not claim depreciation on gst component included in the price of plant and machinery i think yes. i think third sir can explain first then i'll put the fr uh, element of it so first uh, with respect to this uh, gst perspective YPL bought the machinery from Dusham Limited. Means Dusham Limited is the seller, YPL is the buyer for its business for which YPL received a government grant of six lakh. So here, seller has not received the grant, buyer has received the grant. Mm -hmm. So therefore, from the GST perspective, there is no issue because GST implications. This is like a subsidy. Actually, grant. in accounting it is called as grant but it is grant but the better name is subsidy for things like buying electric vehicles or buying solar electric panels electric they might give those subsidy. kind of things so usually what happens is that uh, electric bikes or as you rightly said electric bikes or electric cars when you are buying so the dealer will get that subsidy from the government so that is this and uh, but here uh, surprisingly the subsidy is not received by the seller the subsidy is received by the buyer so this is not going to have impact on the valuation under gst so the valuation part wise if you see the 6 lakhs is irrelevant the details of the machinery are as follows list price of the machinery exclusive of tax and discount is 30 lakhs so this will be taken as the base price or the transaction value so this will be taken as transaction value under section 15 subsection 1 corrugated boxes used for packing the equipment so usually packing expenses are incidental expenses incidental expenses should always be included in the value and uh, moreover it is incurred before delivery of the goods so definitely this should form part of the value for payment of gst but in the given price it is not included so we need to add so we need to add this uh, 60000 and then uh, discount at 2% is offered on the list price of the machine so this discount is duly recorded in the invoice as it is given that it is duly recorded in the invoice means it's a pre supply discount the discount is given before or at the time of supply so like a trade discount so this is a case of trade discount and it is allowed as deduction if you remember chinmay sir was uh, telling one point in previously like a person is selling for 100 and instantly they are giving a discount of 40 40, yeah. 40 rupees is allowed as deduction so which means in this case 2% so this 2% we need to reduce so which means uh, 30 lakhs into 2% 60000 like uh, 6000 60000 60000 60, yeah. they, they made that numbers easy so that yeah, it's oh, easy for effort okay. calculation later okay okay 60000 as a part of its policy ypl depreciates all its plant and machinery at 20% so uh, this is actually another part the valuation is complete here so 30 lakhs plus 60000 minus 60000 means uh, 30 lakhs will be taken as the value here uh, value of supply will be 30 lakhs so and will the subsidy be added sir 6 lakhs no sir that's all the subsidy actually not received by dusham limited uh, no yeah. if it was received by them then if it is received by them then this 6 lakhs also will not be added because uh, the 6 lakhs is subsidy from central government or state government okay okay mm. subsidy from central government or state government not treated as consideration okay sir okay, okay. but so basically you, you give them the price while deciding the price they might have not considered this subsidy 6 mm. lakhs mm. so they were fixed the price 30 lakhs without considering this subsidy mm. so as and when the subsidy is received it should be reduced from 30 lakhs Okay. then the value would have been 24 lakhs 24 lakhs got it got it hmm. so but it's also same thing sir any subsidy you should subtract from the actual cost of the asset right. correct so here here as it is not received by dusham limited so 30 lakhs will be taken as the cost of the machine hmm. 
that is value of the mission on which GST will be computed. Okay. And uh, from the buyer point of view, as buyer is purchasing it for 30 lakhs plus GST, so it has not claimed depreciation on GST component, which means this GST can be taken as ITC. So because okay. one uh, restriction is there, 16 subsection 3, while computing depreciation as per income tax act, block of assets method section 32, if depreciation is computed on GST component, ITC will not be available. Correct, so correct. That they are not claiming depreciation on GST component, which means they can take ITC. That is this YPL. Mm -hmm. Then YPL has got this 6 lakhs as subsidy. What is the treatment of this 6 lakhs of subsidy received by YPL? This is treated like donations. Okay. Donations because it is like uh, they are not having any activity for getting this. So it is like a unconditional donation okay. and not be treated as consideration. So there won't be any GST impact uh, in the hands of YPL on the six lakhs. So just they will recognize this income for accounting point of view or tax point of view. But GST wise, there is no issue on the six lakhs. And since uh, YPL has received, yeah. it will be reduced from the actual cost in for income yeah. tax purpose. Yes. Yeah, then I'll, I will. Uh, the, but can they claim GST? Is it allowable? I mean, just for the knowledge purpose, they can claim immediately. That is also there. I didn't get you, sir. No, if 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 they want to claim GST input credit, immediately okay. they can take. Once upon a time, it was uh -huh. like fifty percent, fifty percent like that. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But uh -huh. now okay. on capital goods also in the same immediate. Okay. Same month uh -huh. they are, they can take. So uh -huh. the advantage is many companies who which do not want to pay. Uh, the liability, what they are doing is that they are making the capital expenditures in those months where they have liabilities so and that they, pay, uh, so they can they use can the off okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, But one person they have to pay. <laughs> that, uh, uh, the donation part they have to pay. But anyway. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I wanted to put out this, this one. So, you need to throw no, some. Yeah, no, in GST they are telling if you don't claim depreciation, then GST is available. Correct. But in accounts, they say, if you don't claim GST, then we can provide depreciation. <laughs> so yeah. we don't have to make first. It's like, uh, it's like hand in chicken, chicken or the egg situation. Yeah. They are yeah. consistent, but we don't know which decision to uh, make it first there. Ah, okay. Uh, as far as the accounting part is concerned, it's very simple. Again, regarding the GST input credit they're taking, so it's not part of the cost and we don't provide depreciation. List price is 30 lakh. Discount is 60,000, so we'll subtract it. And uh, these boxes, which are expenses incurred, will be capitalized because until the asset is ready for use, ready for all use. the carriage inwards, insurance, uh, clearing charges, customs, everything we will add. So basically, it becomes 30 lakhs plus 60,000 minus 60,000. Effectively, it becomes 30 lakh only. Uh, depreciation out 20%. Now, as far as the grant is concerned, in the S20 is same as AS12. So, uh, Punarvas sir told that for the purpose of income tax, you subtract the grant from the asset yes. and you provide depreciation for the remaining amount. Uh, as far as accounting is concerned, they will give you choice. You can show either of the policy. Policy 1, as just Punarvas sir told, 30 lakh uh, minus uh, 6 lakh. So, on 24 lakh, you provide the depreciation over 20%. That is remaining 5 years you provide. The depreciation will happen. That is one choice. The second choice is you show the asset at 30 lakhs only and you provide depreciation on 30 lakh over a period of five years, 20%. Another one is uh, grant you receive, you maintain a separate account called as deferred grant account. So okay. you maintain one asset account and you maintain one deferred grant account, essentially liability account. And in the proportion of depreciation, it goes to P&L. The deferred right. income also goes to p and L. Mathematically, you see it has no impact because mm. 30 lakh, if you apply 20%, you get 6 lakhs. Correct. And if you apply it on 24 lakhs, uh, if you calculate 20%, uh, I think you get 4.8 lakhs. Yeah, 4.8 lakhs. So 4.8 lakh is net depreciation. If I show gross method, overall depreciation is 6 lakh. 30 lakh into 20%, 6 lakh. And this 6 lakh will be spread across 5 years, which is 1 lakh 20,000. 6 lakh minus 1.2, that also comes to the same 4.8 lakhs. So overall net to net basis, profit is not impacted, but balance sheet reporting is different. So one 
my option you show 30 lakhs and uh, 6 lakhs separately second option 30 lakh minus 6 lakh you show it on net basis 24 lakhs but ultimate With impact on pnl wise it is same what so the choice deferred, deferred taxes impact also in my sir no deferred tax would not come because uh, the income tax i mean profit before tax will not change right so it is the same correct the net expense would be same so 6 lakh depreciation is so and 1 lakh 20 the deferred income is also so effectively 4 lakh 80000 would be the impact on uh, pnl account so whichever policy you adopt in the notes in the notes to accounts you have to mention that company followed the method of net basis or the gross basis right so i mean yeah. i generally ask students whether what's the difference between i mean uh, for example i ask is depreciation an accounting principle or a policy so many yeah. people tell it's a policy policy actually it's a principle yeah. it's a rule Policy is the method of applying that principle. So even to qualify simply to tease them, I say, tell me, is depreciation accounting policy or principle? Most of the time they say it's policy because that's what we know. But no, the I method of applying that. Yeah. No, now things have changed one more level. It is neither principle nor policy. For index, it has become an estimate. Okay. Uh, so the accounting policy is the cost model, revaluation model. So okay. if you change from straight line method to WDV, whenever you change an accounting policy, we used to do something called as a retrospective method. Retrospective effect. Even now it is there when you change a policy. But because this is not a policy, they call oh. accounting estimate, estimate. No retrospective accounting. Okay, okay. You change from state line to WD. Yeah. But I remember I did this retrospective calculation. In foundation that, maybe. <laughs> state line, foundation. Yeah. And we that. Now so. things are very simple. It's all yeah. prospective changes. Whatever happened, you forget. You start fresh. Going forward, you do. There Unless is no the cost model to revaluation model. That is a retrospective. Approach. No point crying over spilt milk. So let past be the past is what the concept ah, is. Yes. They made it as accounting estimate. I mean, it's a, in a way true, but yeah, that's a different uh, angle altogether. So friends, as you can see, whatever we discuss is all extempore. We just go through the case study and we don't know what Tarun sir will ask me. I don't know what Chinmay sir will ask me. They don't know what I'll be asking. So it's more of a discussion among friends. That is why we also enjoy because time flies in this. I don't know whether it flies for you or not, but definitely for three of us, definitely flies. It's because it is, in my opinion, to be honest, one of the best subjects ever. And probably in my opinion, this subject is the best in CA because everything is included in this. And we also get to know so many things. So, so many concepts of GST I understood and FR I understood. That's how it is. Each of us, it's a you know constant learning for all of us. So, you also uh, take it the, that way. The, we'll enjoy the, now on the flip side, by doing this, we don't know whether we may end up in doing practice more or then continuing classes because we know yeah. the knowledge. No, we are tempted to use it more in the real right. life as well. <laughs> yeah. Right. Anyway, so the last para guys, finally, last actually para. we have uh, discussed all the answers. To be honest with you, we'll just uh, go to the questions later after this last paragraph. Uh, I will just take it up, no problem. Uh, last paragraph goes like this. Sir, I'll read, sir. Actually, it is related to income tax. I'll read. Oh, okay, sir. Okay, sir. Go ahead. But some CAF and all is there. <laughs> anyway. Now, that sir can throw like CAF. That so many things in, I think, IDT we use that CAF and all. Yeah. Yes, sir. On 24th January 2024, YPL supplied 2000 metric tons steel pipes to SPL at 1 lakh per metric ton on CAF basis. CAF is cost, insurance, and freight basis which means uh, i have collected money even for the insurance and freight so means i need to deliver the product to the customer in his port insurance and freight of 11000 per metric ton were included in it also on 5th february 2024 it made a supply of 3000 metric ton steel pipes to another singapore based company uno pte limited upl at 95,000 per metric ton on FOB basis, for which the payment was to be made of Singapore dollar 5 crore 70 lakhs in three months. And so, in order to protect itself from exchange rate fluctuations, YPL hedged receipt of such foreign currency in the forward market. So, let me complete the customs part and then uh, Punarvasar can share the income tax. Actually, transfer pricing will come. So these two are connected here. So first from customs point of view, if you see, so YPL and actually there is no question related to this in customs given in this case study. But they so can ask. Can be asked. So mm -hmm. YPL and SPL are related. This is the first point discussion we made in the beginning. That is they are related under each and every subject. Right. So on customs also they both are related because they are holding and subsidiary. 
Now, between related parties, whenever the transaction takes place, we will not consider the price at which the transaction takes place. So in this case, this uh, CIF, whatever they sold is irrelevant. So we go for the comparable value method. So under customs valuation rules 2017, in case of export, there is something called as comparable value. And uh, this comparable value is actually the same in income tax because cup method. Mm. Uh, the comparable cup and method, uncontrollable price method, cup method. The same method, cup method is here, but while doing the comparable method, the difference in the price needs to be considered. For example, here uh, they are selling on CIF basis, but the comparable transaction is on FOB basis. FOB basis, yes. So then in that case, what we need to do is that. So we need to take the comparable value as FOB only for the purpose of customs. For the purpose of customs, we need to take FOB because in case of export, in case of export, the value will be FOB value. But mm. income, tax, it will change. income tax, it will change for the purpose of customs. FOB value only will be taken as the value for payment of customs duty. So that FOB value in this case, is 95,000 per metric ton and on that applicable customs duty is computed. Okay. Applicable customs duty is computed. So whatever, but depends whether the export is chargeable to customs or not, depending upon this product. If the product is chargeable to customs duty, we need to pay customs duty. Otherwise, we don't have to pay customs duty on this because as we know, majority of the products exported from India are not leviable under customs, only few, uh, like some 50 entries are there. Only those goods are chargeable to customs duty on export. So right. it depends because as they have not given any rate and all. So, but uh, maybe they give rate on this, we need to pay customs duty. And depending upon number of metric tons, so they have given 2000 metric tons, so 2000 into 95,000 into the customs duty. But remember only basic customs duty is payable if applicable. And uh, we have many additional customs duties like social welfare, surcharge, CVD, SAD, etc. And all. all those things will not be applicable. Only BCD is payable. So that is about uh, customs part. Uh, yes, sir. Punar was, sir, over yes, to you. I'll just add one more, small two points. Uh, because they said uh, they have used the forward market for yeah, that's I want to ask you that question. Yes, uh, yeah. Yeah. That point. Anyway, they are talking about buying of the Singapore dollars which is going to be fluctuating. So they have taken a decision to buy in forward market. So they would have entered into contract to buy Singapore dollar at a fixed rate, maybe like 30 rupees, 35 rupees, something like that. And if they ask you how much payment is going to be made, very simple, whatever the Singapore dollar multiplied by the forward rate, that would be the outflow of it. But sometimes what they tell you is they will not give you the rate directly. They will give you one Singapore dollar is 30 rupees hyphen 31. Mm. So you have to choose uh, whether uh, which is higher one because you're buying, you'll be buying at a higher rate, being a disadvantaged position. So you'll buy at 31 rupees. But if they're given one rupee equals to, in those cases, remember you should divide. And mm. dividing, you should take the lower rate as the higher rate. Meaning if they're told 31.1, or will not be 30 point point. They'll give decimal 0 0.10 or 0 0.12. So 0 0.10 is the lower. 0.12 is higher number. number. That will be lower. That will so be lower. One by 0 0.10 is uh, the decimal wise, it is lower. So when you divide, it will be higher number. Right, so right. when you take a indirect code, that would be the rate. So one, one, small... one by bid is ask and one yeah. by ask is bid. <laughs> I do. I usually don't use that method. I use the, the method of called as uh, uh, left hand side, right hand side. If left hand mm. side currency is there, you multiply. Right hand side currency, you divide. Like if they give one dollar, Singapore dollar is rupees. That is left hand side. Singapore dollar is left hand side. So I multiply. Mm. If it is one rupee, so much Singapore dollar, Singapore dollar is right hand side. So you divide. So depending on that left side, right side, because they use something Oscar. called as. Uh, no, they use word called as home currency and foreign currency. Some mm -hmm. different approaches. Now the question comes in the institute will not give dollar and rupee. They'll give you uh, UK pounds and euro. Now who, which is foreign, which is local. So the left hand side, right hand side is the approach uh, I follow. And one more point in the, all the question here, para five, they've used empty, which is happy. In one of the AFM question, they gave you 
the contract is one metric ton is so much but the information said it is selling at 10 rupees per kg okay so you should know how to convert a metric yeah, yeah. ton into kg right. assume assume mt is equal to kg yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one metric ton is equal to 1000 kg so be aware of it that also might be tested in let's some write cases. down that actually yeah, 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 good, good point. Actually, thousand kgs. So keep it in mind. Everything is expressed here empty, so you are <laughs> safe in that sense. Yes, sir. Yeah. Was Marks right. will be empty then if you don't write. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, guys, so this is about uh, 92 CE of the uh, Income Tax Act that is relating to transfer pricing. Let's go down. First. Thank you, sir. So this is how it is. So basically, if you have an Indian company and um, foreign associated enterprise, here there is an associated enterprise we have already established in the first initial discussion. So if the transaction that they're doing is not within arm's length price, so you know what is arm's length price, basically it is like two uh, the companies are not related to each other. If they had done that particular transaction, whatever that rate would be called as the arm's length price. So basically the other company in this particular area, let me go up. So this is a unrelated company. They made a supply to another Singapore based company at 95,000 metric tons. But since it's FOB, we need to add that portion also. We'll do that. So basically that would be the arm's length price, but here it will not be on arm's length price. So technically 92C is telling that if the transaction is not arm's length, I'll just go down one second now. The transaction is not arm's length price because of which it's resulting in what? Uh, an increase in the total income or a reduction of loss. Increase of total income or reduction in loss. Then you have to apply, you have to make an adjustment. You have to make an adjustment and that adjustment is called as primary adjustment. So to make an adjustment uh, in the tax books that is called primary adjustment. So this is basically your arm's length price minus the transaction price only if it exceeds one crore. This is most important. If the difference between the two exceeds one crore, only then you have to make a primary adjustment. You have to make a primary adjustment. Now, if this is more than one crore, just to balance the entire uh, books, Books of accounts of the associated enterprise also and the SSC also has to be, uh, you know, there is an imbalance, I have to remove the imbalance. To ensure that that imbalance is removed, I also need to make a secondary adjustment. And mind you, secondary adjustment will come only if the difference is more than 1 CR. Otherwise, it will not come. If the difference is more than 1 crore, then secondary adjustment has to be made. And that too, what? If at all, first of all, it should exceed 1 crore. Second, if extra money is lying outside India. I have to bring it back to my country. That is our object. You know, Nirmala Madam wants money. So if the money, because of all this Golmal dealing that I'm doing, I am not paying tax here, but the extra money is lying there. So Nirmala Madam says that that adjusted amounts, whatever adjusted amounts has to be brought back. That is the difference has to be brought back. It has to be brought back within 90 days. That is a prescribed period. If it is not brought back within 90 days, then it is like the, the Indian company has given a loan to the subsidiary company. It is deemed to be a loan. It is deemed to be a loan. So the Indian company has given a loan to the non-Indian associated enterprise and I have to charge interest also. Interest also will be added in the entire tax component. So this is the gist of the story here. In this particular question, let us check here. So here, uh, we, again to recap, SSE is required to carry out something called a secondary adjustment when the primary adjustment of transfer price exceeds 1 crore rupees. Simple. And the second part is the adjustment should be made because this amendment came in 2017. So the adjustment should happen after assessment year 1718 onwards because you cannot make any retrospective uh, amendment which will uh, inconvenience the SSEs. So it was made a prospective amendment. So because of the result of this uh, primary adjustment, if there's an increase in the total income of the SSE or there's a decrease in the uh, loss, whatever it is, the excess money has to be repatriated back, has to be brought back into the country. Now, in case you don't want to bring back, because I have to again follow FEMA regulations and RBI regulations, if it is not possible, and the Indian company, SSE company, has an option, as an option to pay, I'll just write down for the excess portion, 18% tax. 18% tax. Plus surcharge is mandatory, 12% surcharge plus 4% cess. So overall, if you compute, it will come to, if I'm not wrong, around 20.9% or something, 99%, 21% almost. So that you have to pay tax on the excess. In case you do not want to bring it back to India, you need to do it. 
So in this question, both uh, YPL and SPL as discussed initially only are definitely associated enterprises. And the similar goods are also sold by this YPL to one more random company, unrelated party. That is why, as Sir also mentioned, this is whatever, whatever they're in customs, I used to use something called as comparable uncontrolled price method or popularly called as the cup method. Uh, I'm unable to write. Okay, it's okay. Cup method, popularly called as cup method. So maybe Sir will can write that so it's cup method. Comparable uncontrolled price method. So basically the price in a comparable uncontrolled transaction, it has to be adjusted for the difference. So in this question, uh, the price per metric ton is 95,000. And I have to adjust to what? Because I have to bring it to arm's length price. I have to adjust because this is on CIF. And the other one is FOB. So if you see 95,000 is what is to the unrelated party. Sorry, there is some problem here. So unrelated party is 95,000, right? This is on FOB. I need to bring it to CIF. So I have to add what? 95,000 plus the freight. Sir, can you please write? I'm unable yes, to. 95,000. That is the uh, rate to the un the uh, unrelated party. That is at FOB. I have to bring it to CIF. So I have to so add, add 11,000. 11,000. I have to add 11,000 per metric ton. So it's coming up to uh, 1 lakh 6,000 per metric ton. 1 lakh 6,000 per metric ton. Into basically you have 2,000 metric tons, guys. So it is coming up to what? Uh, now I have to see the difference. We will just hold on to 1 lakh 6,000. There it is 1 lakh 6,000. Whereas here, if you see, uh, I mean, actually the price should have been 1,6,000, but I am supplying to SPL at what rate? 1 lakh. 1 lakh. So basically, arm's length price should have been 1,6,000 and not 1 lakh. Okay. So the difference is 6,000. Uh, 6, 6,000 is the shortage. 6,000 okay. per metric ton is the shortage or the excess which has to be collected into 2,000. Into 2,000. Okay. So if you do that, it comes up to 1.2 crores. 1.2 crores. And yes. as discussed initially, Ah, is the, one yes, it is more than one crore. So definitely primary adjustment gets attracted. And uh, now I have an option. Either bring back this excess within 90 days or if it is not possible, pay tax at 20.96%. Uh, 9664, not 99, 20.96 it will come. 20.9664%. 20 20.9664%. You pay the tax and close the deal. So on, on what, this one, one, one crore 20. On one crore, uh, on, yeah, on this, uh, this thing. What is that? One uh, 1.2 1. crore excess. Yeah. On okay. 1.2 crore, which I should have received, I'll have to pay a tax. So no need to keep that money there only, but you pay this tax. Nirmala Madam wants the tax. That's all. She doesn't care about the money coming in. So 1.2 crores into 20.9664%. If you do, it will come up to around. Uh, that is the first question, dear friends. That is the first question. Sir, the first question answer would be option number B then. Uh, should we explain that 20.64? They understand. Which one? Uh, that the 20.64 they understand the tax rate or should we yeah, I explain no it is 18% plus 12 I know but it's 18 into okay. 1, 1, 2, 1, 18 1, 2, 12 percent that I think uh, at this level they'll, they'll, they'll be able to follow it no? yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. So, because they would have done DT also and everything and even oh, I think ADT also is like the same only sure. so yeah that they'll know so a 12 percent of 18 yeah. percent and whatever you figure you get on that 4 percent you add okay. so it will come up to 20.9664 so if you do the math on that 20.9664% of 1.2 crore will give me option number B as well. 15,970. Yes, sir. 25,59. So, guys, we have already discussed the question answers. Quickly, we'll finish off. Second question. Second question is also related to me only. We'll read it quickly and I'll finish it off. There is some now everything uh, is going haywire. Yeah. Second one. Yeah. With reference to information given in para number one, whether any formalities would have to be com uh, complied by YPL. Guys, I already discussed as per section 188, it is office or place of profit and it is more than 2.5 lakh rupees. I told you in the holding company, you have to pass a ordinary resolution. And because Sunita happens to be a related party of the holding company, because she's the daughter of the managing director. So option number A is wrong, option number C is wrong, option number D is also wrong. You have to comply for sure. So option number B is the answer. Yes, as Mrs. Sunita was a related party to YPL and she would be drawing a monthly remuneration exceeding 2.5 lakh in a subsidiary company, formality should be done in YPL limited. And what is that YPL formality? Ordinary resolution. Board resolution will be passed anyway. Ordinary resolution has to be passed and then that has to be done. Sir, third question is GST, sir. Yes, sir. So, in the third question, uh, 
with reference to the information given under para 2, how much balance in electronic credit ledger would be available with YPR after discharging its GST liability for the May month for which Mr. Kailash was consulted. As we already discussed, so their liability was some uh, 110 lakhs and uh, they had some credit. So, but this 110 lakhs, they have to pay 1% through cash ledger, which is 1 lakh 10,000. Okay. So, remaining 99%, they will be paying using credit ledger. So, okay. that will come to the remaining, that is, so that is 108 lakh. Yeah, 90,000. 90, 90,000. 110 lakhs. Yeah, into 99 percent yes 108 lakhs 90 thousand so there's one lakh ten thousand so 108 lakh 90 thousand and uh, they have got some credit so that credit also we have seen in that some opening balance some 60 lakhs plus some 50 seven lakh 50. so that is the credit so the answer i'm just showing you so here yeah yes so they had a credit of 56 plus 60, 116. So, but 108 lakh 90,000 only they can use from the credit. So the balance will be 7 lakh 10,000. 10, okay. So that 7 lakh 10,000 will be the answer for this. So which already we discussed. So uh, okay, this is uh, this is as per the GST records, right? Because as per accounts, it will be different. Accounts, it will be different. As per GST records, so this is the balance in uh, credit ledger. But clearly they asked electronic yeah. credit. Because it will be for GST on this day. Uh, yes. Electronic credit ledger is a ledger which is maintained by GST network on behalf of the registered person. So we will maintain input tax credit ledger. So that is for accounting. This electronic credit ledger, they will maintain. So therefore, uh, definitely it is as per GST records only. Then this question, fourth question. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll out. With reference to the information given under para 3, Till what time period? I told you it can be done six months before the expiry. Yeah, five and years and six months. months. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. So okay. option B, option B is the answer. Six months before the expiry. December expires. So okay. uh, to, 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 we filed with a fee of five thousand. Five thousand. Then, so then uh, the oh, missionary, what is mm -hmm. the value of supply of missionary? Already we did the computation. It will be thirty lakhs. That is thirty lakhs. Uh, thirty lakhs sixty thousand. The thirty lakhs. Plus 60,000. Minus 60,000. Oh, minus 60,000. So that right. takes to, you know, 30 lakhs. 30 lakhs, yeah. Same thing and like accounts there, yeah. Two questions. Sir, first two questions is auditing, which I have actually explained fully. During explain. the yes. so and the last it's... question, uh, uh, Chinmay, sir. In the yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, with reference to the information below, show the statement of profit and loss and extract of balance sheet in respect of uh, guarantees. Yeah. So two methods we discussed. Either you can show it on gross basis, net basis. The same thing they are showing it here. So when the government is, I mean, the, when the government grant is uh, treated on uh, gross basis, you can see here depreciation is charged on thirty lakh twenty percent without taking grant into consideration. Then the grant grant was six lakh. It's spread across five years. So that's how oh, they yes. got 1,20,000. Right. So uh, to, uh, the, it, it is in the same proportion as with respect to uh, depreciation. But just one small point here is because it was straight line method, you can simply divide by five. Mm. What if it was WDV method? You can't apply that rate here. Mm. So you have to calculate under WDV method, year one, what is depreciation, year two, year three, year four, year five. In this proportion, you have to divide the six lakh. For and five years, you, you don't have that problem. GST always deemed useful life of the asset is five years. Five years. Okay. That's what they're given. <laughs> yeah. Here you have to do in the proportion. So as far as balance sheet is concerned, okay, a small point, I think you should uh, explain this. Uh, Non-current assets, that is fixed assets, 30 lakh minus six lakh depreciation, 24 lakh, that is uh, asset minus depreciation. Okay. This one I have to explain. Six lakh is the amount of grant received, 1,20,000 went to P&L account. Mm. So remaining 4.8 lakhs will come in balance sheet. Mm. And this 4.8 lakhs, we should divide this into current liability and non-current liability. Oh. Current portion, non-current portion. That is because of this 4.8 lakh, 1.2 lakh will come in the next year. Within 12 months, it will hit P&L. 
ಕ್ಯಾಲ್ಕುಲೇಷನ್ ಪಾರ್ಟ್ so that is the non current 360 and immediately next year what is likely to come that is current portion 120000 yes. that is on the part a if it is the report on net basis this confusion will not come 30 lakh is the amount of asset 6 lakh is the grant received net amount is 24 lakh and on oh. 24 lakh you apply 20% straight forward 4 lakh it is on depreciation 24 lakh minus 4 lakh 80000 net 19 lakh 20 no other time current non current deferred income those situation will not and we can choose whichever method we want yeah uh, you, but in the exam you have to show both uh, ah, okay. or you write one and mention that other alternative is possible practically ah. you can show you can do uh, either of the methods yes. Ah. yes guys with this we completed case two. finally <laughs> yeah. which was given in rtp but but actually four hours exam and uh, because we explained a lot of other things because of which only it will take time so i uh, don't think like uh, we will also take this much time like that because we explain a lot of other aspects but otherwise if you stick on to the question and answer so yes in one hour definitely you will be able to complete and uh, there is no clarity about whether we need to give the reasoning for the mcq so that they have not given if it is like i mostly i think it will be like omr type only wherein you just shade the mcq options and descriptive alone you need to write but uh, let's wait uh, whether i say is sir, but in paper 6d earlier they had to write in the question paper only sir uh, option and reasoning they were writing that time option reasoning. so then the same uh, reasoning also they were expecting is it at that huh? time reasoning they were expecting oh, they were giving uh, reasons also okay. so but even if reasons are not there maybe students were just writing rtp as they gave it like this with reasoning mm -hmm. So then uh, maybe students also will be required Text to write, to write no, we, we, that we don't know because RTP might be to explain us students ah. so, because see in the RTP at the beginning they mentioned no answer also will be so no, I no, thought... no, no, no sir in the first but the beginning you check they told topic covered in the exam they will not mention like that correct sir so it's also from students perspective so answer but will yeah, I know. feel sir they will give topic covered I feel I feel they will yeah. give topics covered so that the student can be in handy take the respective section right. and uh, refer and write so maybe okay. i think it will be given right. it's maybe let us be very clear don't tomorrow yes, tell karun sir told this pj yeah. sir told this. <laughs> maybe we don't know so it's a first attempt so we also don't know but right. uh, we are doing our best possible whatever by discussing all this each so like this in our product also which we have ibs we have discussed all the case studies in fact still almost two case studies are remaining everything is done so institute has released around uh, 15 Plus, we are doing uh, two, three more. Apart from that, we have the student journal around three questions that also we'll be doing, plus RTP two questions. So, overall, 20 plus case studies. If you do that, and each of them will be two, two and a half hours like this. So, if you do that, apart from that, we have revision classes also, guys, for each and every subject FR, AFM, law, everything, some 20, 20, 20 hours like that. So, they're only 100 hours over. Plus, I, we don't have classes for SF, uh, CMP and auditing. So, they again, don't come back to us saying that that is not provided. We're very clear on it. Only a few tips here and there we'll give later. Uh, so apart from that, we have FR, AFM, Law, uh, DD, IDT, revision classes are there, 20, 25 hours each. So that only will go up to 100, 125 hours, plus this discussion around 40, 50 hours. So 150, 160 hours, more than sufficient for you to get a beautiful understanding of the entire subject. And as and when Institute releases more case studies, we'll definitely keep doing them. Apart from that, books, we have some more extra case studies for your practice, which you can do. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe the third search can just conclude. I just add one or two points. So from the student perspective, I really I understand that you are following through a difficult pace and this is challenging. It's a new subject. So what I would recommend is here or in life, I follow a simple policy. When you don't know what to do, do what you can. Applying that principle here, there is so much in, infinite possibility of questions here. We really don't know what to prepare. But what, what we do? Institute has given these case studies. Let us make sure we prepare these case studies. And if these case studies comes in exam and you are not able to do it, then you don't 
have any authority to point the finger at anybody else because this is a defined set is given to you. If the case study comes out of this, then you should not have any excuse. Beyond right. this, in my opinion, this has given you the base with our revision classes, with this much of discussion of the problems along with possible areas, if you can listen to us, along with the revision classes, with your practical experience, in our opinion, you are prepared enough to face the examination. So I would say all the best, go with this approach. Parun sir, the closing comments. Sir, uh, actually, you know, what Chinmay sir said is true because I remember when ACMP came, mm -hmm. I said it is one case study booklet. So for SCMP, and in the first two attempts, May 18, November 18 and all, lot of patients came from the case study booklet only with change in names, etc. Yeah, and also, sir, okay. questions were changed. The case study was the same. Case study was same. So therefore, uh, maybe the same, what sir said, so whatever this 20 case studies that is given by ICI, out of this itself, maybe some four case studies like right. permutation and combination they could take and they might be giving. So therefore, if you are thorough with this and more and moreover, so based on uh, Punarvas sir's idea, so we are planning for some top 100 and Chinmay Sol also gave this idea. So we are planning for some top 100 concepts. So to release it in our YouTube channels as well. So we are in the process. We will do that. And those 100 concepts will cover all the subjects kind of. At least that much you should be knowing kind of things. So yes, we are there to support you. Signing off. Take care. And all the very best for your preparation. Hope you all made the exam applications. So the due date is I think 25th of February. So all the best for your preparation. Take care guys. Bye. All the best guys. Bye.